Hello. Hello, sir. Sir, good. Sir, good morning. Good afternoon. Afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Doctor Gurnule. Sir, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> sir, Professor, uh, same as joined. Okay, very good. Very nice. Hello. Hello. Oh, sir, good morning. Good morning. Hello, how are you? Fine. Good morning. Good afternoon. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Dr. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. A pleasure to join you. Professor, same as Okay. Uh, I'll go back into the backgrounds until later. Do you have any questions for me or? Hello, how are you? Fine. Professor Simmons. Yeah. Yeah. Pleasure to join you. Yeah, I'll go back into the backgrounds until later. Do you have any questions for me? Or... Sahita Tiwari. Hello. Hello, madam. Hello, Tiwari, madam. Hello, Dr. Sahita. Hello. Ah, hello. Oh, I hope not. I think I'll put a new one. Hello, sir. Namaste, sir. Namaste, madam. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello, Dr. Sahita? Yes, sir. Can you hear my voice? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello? Sir, shall I start? No, no. Wait, wait, sir. Not, uh, yes. But like, sir, other guest not joined till now, okay? Yes, sir. Yes, wait, sir. I will take, I will take the time now because yes, our sir. timing is 2 o'clock to start, okay? okay? Yeah. Okay. Sir, Yes, sir. Uh, you are testing? Yes, sir. I need uh, okay. permission. Okay, okay. One minute. You can share now.
इतुन दिन अमी पाप के दिन है इतुन वन पार्टिसिपेंट कैन शेयर नो होट्स डिजेबल परमिशन स्क्रीन शेयरिंग हेलो सुनको से नाउ शेयर यस सर ओके हाँ ओके उनको से ओके ना ओके यस ओके सर आई एम नॉट हियरिंग दैट साउंड बट इज देयर ओके ओके या ओके थैंक यू तो बस वी कैन स्टार्ट एट टू ओ क्लॉक ओके ना या यस यस Uh, there is time now, fourteen uh, minutes. No, yes. uh, twelve, twelve, thirteen minutes. Okay. Yes. Uh, Rakhi, madam, has also joined. Okay, fine. But madam is now uh, <laughs> is not well.
जो ब्लैक लेवल का बम्पर छह हजार अरे विदेशी है ना सर विदेशी माल पूरा सस्ता होने वाला है जानी वाकर की जितना ब्रांड है ना जानी वाकर के कम से कम पचास ब्रांड है आपको बता रहा हूँ ब्लेंडर ब्लेंडर नहीं होगी सस्ती बन के किसी ने बोला निकल गया आवाज हेलो हेलो प्रोफेसर बालाजी सर गुड आफ्टरनून गुड आफ्टरनून सर गुड आफ्टरनून सर हाउ आर यू आई एम फाइन आई एम फाइन प्रोफेसर फॉर इज जॉइनिंग आफ्टर सम टाइम ओके ना या श्योर सर वन रिक्वेस्ट टू यू because of parej the mother's uh, some uh, yeah, illness na some critical stage is there okay, okay. so uh, he was the guest okay na uh, presidential okay for today okay. inauguration now you uh, i am requesting you to be a chief guest uh, say some few words okay for today inauguration okay na okay okay sir okay sir yes, yes sir. okay yeah uh when should i um, uh, sir, interact uh, like uh, uh, sir uh, uh, after the you know uh, uh, before your uh, presidential address okay na 
So okay. you know, the anchor uh, can invite you. Okay. So okay. just uh, after fifteen, uh, like that, na. So we will speak another that. Okay. 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 So yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. प्रभु सर गुड आफ्टरनून गुड आफ्टरनून सर कशे आहात सर बरे आहेत बरे आहेत आपण नेहमी व्हर्च्युअली भेटतो सर हो या या आता पॅन्डेमिक झालं की आपण एक फिजिकली पण एक घेऊ आपल्याकडे इंटरनॅशनल कॉन्फरन्स बोलू सर आहेतच येस 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 कशी आहे परिस्थिती नागपुरात आता तर सर्व फिजिकली मोड मध्ये सुरू झाले आहेत ऑनलाईन असलं तर त्यांना ऑप्शन आहे ऑप्शन आहे बरोबर म्हणून आता एक मै कमीत कमी वन वीक वी विल सी ओके वॉट विल बी द इम्पॅक्ट इफ वी आर नॉट सेंडिंग देम लिंक and yes. forcing them to come for physical classes yes sir otherwise uh, they will prefer to stay at home only ha ah, that is we have also started since monday since tuesday yeah yeah now students are slowly coming yeah right 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 <laughs> let us hope we will overcome this pandemic no it will come back to normal within right, a right, right. months i think no problem and this will be the routine uh, decisions yes after, after that it will just become very common like cold common and like yeah yeah right and because of the transition in the seasons yes yes that always happens yes i know ha agrawal ji namaskar namaskar good afternoon अब वाला तो हो गया है अभी फिलहाल मतलब टेम्परेरीली अभी हमने एडवांस एक महीने का ले लिया है ऑरेंज में हाँ ट्वेंटी फाइव में ट्वेंटी फाइव में इसे ट्वेंटी फाइव ठीक है ना नहीं वो अभी तो वो फिलहाल हैवी है क्योंकि वो भी उसे खाली करवाने नेक्स्ट मंथ में नहीं
Badwaik sir, can we start? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, sir, we are going to start now. Yes, sir. Sir, pick us two o'clock. Okay, sir, Ita, madam. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, am I audible clearly? Yes. Okay. So, good afternoon, one and all, and wishing you a very happy and healthy New Year 2022. This is Dr. Sarita Tiwari. On behalf of Kamla Nehru Mahavidyalaya, I welcome you all in two-day webinar, international webinar on chemistry education, IWCE 2021, under ACT Research Convention 2021, organized by Association of Chemistry Teachers, Mumbai, Department of Chemistry, Kamla Nehru Mahavidyalaya, Nagpur, and Department of Chemistry, Government Madhav Science, PG College, Ujjain. Respected participants, before moving further, it's an humble request to please mute their audio and turn off videos. So here we are for the first day of international webinar on chemistry education. Kamla Nehru Mahavidyalaya is the best among the top colleges of Nagpur city. Our college name has been taken with respect for discipline by the parents as well as by the academician. This webinar is an initiative to ponder over the new challenges in the area of education and technology under globalization and current pandemic situation, and to highlight the initiative to be undertaken. Higher Education Institute needs to blend high value deliveries with modern learning tools to ensure that each institution has a safe, healthy, energizing, intellectually challenging, and joyful learning environment which could be achieved through education technology. We are happy to announce that we have a total of 4,498 participants from 28 different countries have registered for this webinar. Thank you all for this overwhelming response. Now we are initiating our inaugural session. Before we start the inaugural session, let me pay my homage to Honorable late Govind Rauji Vanjari sir, Founder President of Amaseva Mandal Nagpur. I also acknowledge the patronage of Honorable Dr. Suhasini Vanzari, Madam, President Amaseva Mandal, Honorable MLC Advocate Abhijit Vanzari, Sir, Secretary Amaseva Mandal, and Honorable Dr. Smita Vanzari, Madam, Treasurer Amaseva Mandal. I have got privilege to welcome Professor D.V. Prabhu, Sir, General Secretary ACT and also president of this inaugural session. I also welcome chief guest and inaugurator of today's event, Honorable Professor B.S. Walaji, sir, professor from JNU, New Delhi. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Arpan Bhardwar, sir, principal, Government Madhav Science College, PG College, Ujjain. Further, I extend a sincere welcome to Dr. Dilip Bhardwaik, sir, principal, Kamla Nehru Mahavidyalaya, Nagpur. I warmly welcome Professor Rakhi Gupta, National Convener, Secretary Central Zone, ACT, IIS, Jaipur. I wish to welcome speakers of technical session day one, Dr. Seamus Denley from Australia and Dr. Uday Maitra, IISC, Bangalore. I extend my warm welcome to Dr. W. B. Gurnale, sir, Convener, and Professor M. Swaminathan, sir, co-convener of today's webinar. So let me welcome all distinguished guests for the inaugural se session and technical session. I must acknowledge the participants for this overwhelming response. I welcome all the academicians who have registered for this two-day international webinar on chemistry education across the country. Now we will commence the inaugural session. And for this, I request Honorable Professor B. S. Balaji So who is the chief guest of this inaugural session to light the digital lamp by your auspicious hand. Digital lamp lighting, please. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, sir. Moving ahead, I request Dr. W. V. Gurnule, sir, Professor Kabla Nehru Mahavidyalaya, and convener of this conference, to put his convener speech. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Madam. Good morning to all of you. On behalf of ACT and organizing committee, I welcome all the resource persons, academicians, and participants for this international webinar on chemistry education under ACT Research Convention 2021, organized by Association of Chemistry Teachers, Mumbai, Madhav Science PG College, Ujjain, and Kamla Nehru Mahavidyalaya, Nagpur. Honorable Dr. Bejesh Parisar, President of today's uh, inauguration, but could not join. Uh, President of Association of Chemistry Teachers of ACT, and uh, Chief Guest of today's inauguration session, Dr. Balaji Sir from JNU, uh, Professor D.V. Prabhu, General Secretary of ACT. Uh, Principal of our college, Dr. D.S. Badwaik, sir. Principal of Madhav Science, PG College, Ujjain. Dr. Arpan Bhadwar, sir. Dear participants from the globe and from various parts of the country. At first, I would like to make a special mention of Honorable Dr. Vanjari, madam, President of Amarsiva Mandal, and Honorable Advocate Abhijit Vanjari, sir, MLC and Secretary of Amasya Mandal, and Dr. Smita Vanjari, Madam, Treasurer of Amasya Mandal. Though they could not join us, aid their blessing and best wishes are with us. For the inauguration, uh, Dr. Balaji sir has given a time to be a chief guest. So uh, we are highly obliged to you, sir. I offer a warm welcome on this occasion on behalf of organizing committee. I also extend warm welcome to Professor D.V. Prabhu sir, who accepted our invitation to be a chief guest and uh, what is here, the president for this inauguration session. And uh, I also welcome uh, the Raki Gupta madam, a national convener of research convention of ACT 2021. I also welcome the principal, Dr. Arpan Bhadwaj of Madhav Science PG College, Ujjain, and also uh, Dr. Badwaik, sir. All these guests accepted our request to be a present here for the inauguration session of this international webinar. As we know, the development of many technology that make our life comfortable is closely related to the chemistry education. Chemistry education or chemical education is the study of teaching and learning chemistry. It is one of the discipline based on the education research. Topics in chemistry education include understanding how students learn chemistry and determine the most efficient method to teach chemistry. There are many societies of chemistry education and research which have made tremendous contribution to the science and technology. Chemistry and chemical process have a major, major important role to play in the development and research. The scientific study of matter and its properties and the interaction with each other matter with energy. It is a science that deals with the properties, composition and structure of and substances. The reactions and transformation they undergo and the energy release are from each process, often known as the central science so chemistry is the concern with the atoms as building blocks. So the main objective of organizing the international webinar is to provide a platform for interaction and collaboration among the eminent professional researchers, scholars of from both academia and industry under one roof to discuss and share the state of art of the development in chemical education. This webinar will be definitely beneficial to the participant in their field in general and young researcher in particular. Scientific knowledge and technological skill, particularly on the regards to energy and environment, 
मेडिसिन एंड हेल्थ केयर मोबिलिटी एंड ट्रांसपोर्टेशन इन्फॉर्मेशन एंड कम्युनिकेशन आर वेरी मच एसेंशियल फॉर द फ्यूचर वेलफेयर ऑफ दिस सोसाइटी एनी प्रोग्रेस इन दिस टेक्नोलॉजिकल एरिया क्रिटिकली डिपेंड्स ऑन द डेवलपमेंट ऑफ न्यू एंड फंक्शनल मटीरियल विद द इम्प्रूव एंड नोवेल प्रॉपर्टीज a wide range of interest in diverse field of chemistry physics biological science material science will be covered here to contribute significantly to the community of chemistry education in this webinar the current status future scope of the uh, chemistry education will be focused for the benefit of science society and industry at large for this international webinar around 4498 participant Have registered from 28 different countries like United States of America, France, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Japan, UAE, Malaysia, Tunisia, Iran, Brazil, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Iraq, Republic of Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Pakistan, Nepal, UK, Mexico, Germany, Philippines, Oman, South Korea, Morocco, South Africa, and almost all the state of India. So I welcome all these participants on this occasion. we have a great opportunity to be benefited by the talks of uh, prof uh, dr simas dalami uh, from the dalkin university melbourne australia uh, dr uday maitra sir professor of uh, de uh, department of organic chemistry of indian institute of science bangalore uh, dr ds balaji uh, associate professor from school oh. of biotechnology jawaharlal nehru university new delhi and professor s murgan farmer uh, hod of st hindu college nagar koi So, at last again, as a convener of today's inauguration webinar, I welcome all the resource persons, speakers, and academicians and participants. Thank you. What do you, madam? Hi. Can I? We need to. Okay, okay. Let's screen off. Let's see. Who is this one? Okay. हेलो हेलो सर एम आई ऑडिबल यस सर यू आर ऑडिबल यस सर एक्चुअली देयर इज अ प्रॉब्लम इन माय लैपटॉप थैंक यू गुड नाइट सर थैंक यू गुड नाइट सर फॉर गिविंग अस द इनसाइड ऑफ आवाज नहीं आवाज बोल रहा हूं इन म्यूट कर था उस ने बने देवीदास बक जुट करना करना हेलो इंटरप्शन सेटिंग करनी पड़ेगी somebody is interrupting kindly request him yes sir okay uh now our next speaker is professor rakhi gupta who is the rector and registrar and professor at iisc university jaipur and has more than two decades of both academic and administrative experience professor gupta was formerly the principal of the international college for girls which today has acquired an all new identity as the iis university currently she is the secretary of the central zone of act professor gupta is a member of the curriculum development committee of a number of universities she is also a recipient of the prestigious summer research fellowship of the indian academy of science at iit mumbai she has published about 35 research papers in academic journals of repute she also has a patent to her credit uh, 
Professor Gupta was going to introduce us about the motive of research convention, but due to health issues, she will not be able to speak today. So sorry for this inconvenience to all the participants. Now, moving ahead, I request respected principal, Dr. Dilip Arvaik, sir, to deliver an introductory remark. Over to you, principal, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Good afternoon, one and all. I was First, I pay humble tribute to visionary leader, Lexi Govind Rauji Vanjari, founder president of Amar Sava Mandal, which runs our Kamla Nehru Mahavidyale in Nagpur. On behalf of Kamla Nehru Mahavidyale, I, Dr. Dilip Badwai, principal of the college, extend a warm welcome to all the respected guests, research scholars, and faculty members on the occasion of inaugural function of two days international webinar on MSc education. This international webinar is jointly organized by Association of Chemistry Teachers, Department of Chemistry, Kamla Nehru Mahavidyale, and Government Madhav Science PG College, Ujjain. The chairperson for this inaugural function, none other than Professor D.V. Prabhu, sir, General Secretary, ACT. Chief guest for this inaugural function, Professor Yaz Balaji from JNU, New Delhi. Other guest, Honorable Professor Dr. Brijesh Pare, President ACT, and Honorable Treasurer of Amar Seva Mandal, Honorable Dr. Smita Banjari, ma'am, could not grace the dais because of some urgent issues they are having. The eminent speaker for this two days international webinar. Dr. Seamus Dilani from Australia, Dr. Uday Mitra from Institute of Science, Bangalore, Dr. S.S. Balaji from JNU, and Professor S. Murugan from Nagargoi, Dr. Arpan Bhardwaj, Principal of Government, Madhav Science College, Ujjain, National Convener, Professor Rakhi Gupta, ma'am, Convener, Professor W.B. Gurnole, Co-convener, Professor Yam Swaminathan, all research scholars from different corners of India as well as abroad. Once again, I welcome you all with my words in this shiny but little, little bit cold afternoon. Friends, we are facing challenges due to COVID-19 pandemic. Currently, we are facing third wave of Omicron variant of coronavirus. It spread rapidly, but since we can see from the newspaper, it seems to be cause less mortality. But don't be careless and follow the guidelines by the government of India and ICMR. Dear friends, this pandemic situation, our Kamla Nehru Mahavidyalaya converted into, into the opportunities. Since last two years, are updating the knowledge of our faculties and faculties around the area. We have organized young number of national and international webinars. I congratulate all the three institutes for rightly organizing this two days international webinar on chemistry education. I am not the right person to comment on the topic, but since I am a man of physics, Physics and chemistry always go hand in hand. Therefore, it is customary demand to say few words yes, on the topic. Chemistry education is a study of teaching and learning chemistry. It is one subset of STEM education. Topics is chemistry education includes understanding how students learn chemistry and determining the most efficient method to teach chemistry there is a constant need to improve chemistry curricula and learning outcome based on finding of chemistry education research. Chemistry education is important because the field of chemistry is fundamental to our world. The universe is a subject to the law of chemistry. While human beings depend on the orderly progress of chemical reactions within their bodies, described as the central science, which connects 
फिजिकल साइंस विद लाइफ साइंसेस एंड अप्लाइड साइंसेस केमिस्ट्री हैज एप्लीकेशन इन फूड मेडिसिन एंड अदर इंडस्ट्रीज एंड इन्वायरमेंट टू लर्निंग केमिस्ट्री अलाउड स्टूडेंट टू लर्न अबाउट द साइंटिफिक मेथड्स एंड गेन स्किल इन क्रिटिकल थिंकिंग डिडक्टिंग रीजनिंग प्रॉब्लम सॉल्विंग एंड कम्युनिकेशन टीचिंग केमिस्ट्री टू द स्टूडेंट्स एट द यंग एज कैन इंक्रीज स्टूडेंट इंटरेस्ट इन स्टेम करियर केमिस्ट्री ऑल्सो प्रोवाइड स्टूडेंट्स विथ मेनी ट्रांसफरेबल स्किल्स कैट कैन बी अप्लाइड टू एनी करियर under the dynamic leadership of respected dr swasini panjari madam president amar seva mandal respected advocate abhijit vanjari sir mlc and secretary amar seva mandal and respected dr smita vanjari ma'am treasurer amar seva mandal ar kamla nehru mahavidyalay each continue to attend a new height as a result ar kamla nehru mahavidyalay is reaccredited a plus grade with cgpa 3.53 by nac this is the highest cgpa of all colleges in vidarbha region our kamla nehru mahavidyalaya offers nine graduation 22 pg courses thank you pg diploma six six higher learning and research centers that includes physics chemistry electronic computer science english and commerce many students have been awarded phd degree and many are doing their research from our center we are imparting education to around 8000 students we always strive hard for the academic excellence and overall development of the students as gurunal sir rightly said we received overwhelming response more than 4000 participant registered for this e webinar on chemistry education eminent person in this international webinar are internationally acclaimed in their areas their deliberation will definitely aid to the principal to the participants knowledge i wish great success to this international webinar thank you thank you very much over to you ma'am thank you sir uh, for your introductory remarks now i humbly request dr arpan bhardwaj sir principal government madhav science pg college ujjain to give introductory remark over to you sir dr bhardwaj sir Arthaswar is already there. Yeah. Doctor Bhajwaj sir, am I audible, sir? Am I audible, sir? Hello, hello. Okay. Yes. Okay, sir. Okay. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. please unmute your mic because uh, we are unable to hear it hello he will be joining in a moment please he will be joining in a moment okay is it hello yes sir ha uh, good afternoon good afternoon uh, yes sir welcome sir to the webinar uh, i first of all i would like to congratulate and uh, wish uh, my heartfelt thanks to dr dv prabhu he is uh, here in this webinar wo mother science college mein bhi the hamare sath mein to sabse pehle main unko pranam karta hu aur then i will uh, like to start with the saying that uh, i am thankful to amar seva mandal who has organized this uh, great event basically because uh, organizing such kind of event and inviting such kind of people who are uh, who are like they are they are like stars in the galaxy you know in this they are they are like uh, everyone will like to look at them and we like to uh, inspire from them and we like to take energy from them 
so people like uh, professor maitra uh, professor delne professor who are who are with us we will be definitely uh, be very much benefited by these talks in these two days but uh, as the subject says that we are talk we are talking about chemistry education so we must understand that what the chemistry education is all about so if we know what the chemistry is the term chemistry itself comes from as it comes from the latin it doesn't mean so much for a common man because uh, it means that how to convert everything into gold and that what the chemists were doing and from where the chemistry term uh, derived but if you look at the indian mythology and if you find this similar word in hindi in uh, sanskrit it is rasayan it's all about the world which is moving and which is uh, uh, which is live and which is moving ra means uh, gatishil and sa means srishti to jo bhi kuch gatishil hai srishti mein wo sabhi kuch uh, uska sabhi ka adhyayan rasayan mein hai aur jab gati hoti hai tab uh, whenever there is a movement there is uh, energy involved so any energy change in the world in the universe is a subject of chemistry so if you look at the chemistry in this uh, way that we are talking about uh, not about the technology to become wealthy but to uh, understand the laws of universe the laws of life the laws of uh, nature because everything which is moving which is uh, changing energy is a subject of chemistry studies so we will be able to teach chemistry in a better way and as new education policy has come and it talks about uh, so of course we are in the global scenario in this webinar but in indian concept i would like to add that we have to uh, include more aspects in chemistry teaching chemistry teaching through technology may be a, one aspect but there are many more things which must be added to the chemistry to make it more interesting make it more uh, understandable and make it more close to the lives because the life is all about chemistry whenever the chemistry uh, is stopped uh, chemical reactions is stop whenever the addition of oxygen to hemoglobin is stops whenever the conversion of uh, uh, hemoglobin to oxyhemoglobin is stops the life stops and chemistry on the universe stops for ourselves so we have to understand that how important the chemistry is for a life for our for human life and for life in the nature and not only even when you you don't have life uh, it is it is a matter of chemistry again even a, any body in the universe is a matter of uh, chemistry so uh, we have to understand chemistry in new lights we have to teach chemistry in new lives we have to teach chemistry as a new aspect of chemistry not in the traditional way not only the rules and laws what the chemistry has but how are they governing the universe how are they controlling the universe how are they changing the universe so started from as uh, professor badwaik said starting from though he is a man of physics and today we have uh, we are celebrating punnitithi of boson uh, particle uh, uh, father of boson particle mr san bos uh, we are celebrating his punnitithi also today so this is a wonderful day to be interdisciplinary Uh, in the science not only science but the when science it meets with art form different art forms so when you understand what the chemistry is what the colors what are the colors and how are they related with the chemistry so if we if we teach chemistry in the way which is more close to the hearts of the students more close to the heart of academicians and uh, more close to the heart of people who are interested in science it's not about only science students it must be the chemistry is for the scientific temper it must be taught to develop scientific temper in the society to make the society progressive so teaching chemistry is really a challenge and making it interesting for the people who are not as such chemistry people uh, to in, encourage them to involve them in chemistry learning is a challenging task for all the chemistry people who are uh, here in uh, this platform so i once again i thank all the organizers amar seva mandal uh, miss uh, the vanzari family all the people mrs uh, suhasni vanzari and uh, all the speakers who are here and especially again i would like to thank professor prabhu 
आपको देखा सर बहुत अच्छा लग रहा है और बहुत साल पहले आपको देखा था और ये रिक्वेस्ट करता हूँ सर कि बहुत जल्दी प्रोफेसर पारे ही ऑल्सो ज्वाइन एस प्रोबेबली ही विल ज्वाइन एस आई होप एवरीथिंग इज ओके एंड ही विल ज्वाइन एस एंड आई अगेन थैंक कमला नेहरू कॉलेज फॉर मेकिंग अस को होस्ट फॉर दिस ग्रेट इवेंट वंस अगेन आई थैंक यू ऑल एंड आई रिक्वेस्ट मैम टू मेक द प्रोग्राम रोलिंग थैंक यू वेरी मच thank you sir thank you very much sir, for your worthy words uh, after this now i take the privilege to invite honorable professor b s balaji professor jnu new delhi and chief guest of today's webinar to deliver his address and before that let me have a pleasure to introduce honorable professor b s balaji sir professor b s balaji is an established name in the academic circle of delhi he is actively engaged in the teaching learning and research activities sir has more than 100 publications in national and international journal of repute sir has delivered various lectures and invited speakers in national international conferences seminars he has also guided phd students and has successfully completed over more than 3 research product projects with this brief introduction i request chief guest of today's function uh, professor b s balaji sir to deliver his speech over to you sir uh, good afternoon to one and all am i audible yes sir you are clearly audible okay um, <clears throat> since uh, brijesh pare sir is not actually participating today so i'll just uh, give brief about uh, what is the association of chemistry teachers they are doing and then i will start my uh, little uh, introductory speech so association of chemistry uh, teachers was instituted in 2000 its main purpose is to promote excellence in chemistry education unlike their counterpart which is the indian chemical society which mainly caters to the entire community of chemists and the members of allied sciences Association of Chemistry Teachers is an apex national body which is mainly focusing on educators that means high higher secondary school teachers college university lecturers professors and to some extent scientists and teachers because basically the teachers are the people who shape the future of a nation so keeping that in mind association of chemistry teachers mainly focuses on teaching community so on their important activities are various <clears throat> is conducting stage 1 uh, selection test for the most popular indian national chemistry olympiad and the selected students are mainly trained by the act mentors because this is one of the great <coughs> job the contribution from the act members for uh, shaping the future of the students that is making them to participate in international olympiad and over the past several years many of the act trained students performed exceptionally well and received various accolades like gold and silver medals at the international chemistry olympiad this clearly tells the contributions made by association of chemistry to the development of chemistry subject in india and other activities of the act include interaction with the government education departments and offering assistance to syllabi formation and the implementation of the cutting edge research activities in the syllabus to various colleges and universities currently over 2400 life members are associated with association of chemistry teachers internationally act is collaborating with the royal society of chemistry from united kingdom and the international union of pure and applied chemistry that is iupac and act rsc chemistry teacher training program is a flagship program which trains various school and college teachers in the chemistry education along with that act's dst chemistry popularization workshop is well received by many colleges and schools these are some of the activities pursued by association of chemistry teachers by conducting various hands on training association of chemistry teachers is working tirelessly to strengthen chemistry education in india and to motivate students to pursue chemistry as a career 
So these are all the various activities that is being pursued by Association of Chemistry teachers. And I salute their tireless contribution to the development of chemistry in India. Of course, Indian chemistry is uh, well recognized throughout the world. If you look at uh, the pharmaceutical industry, India is one of the leading generic manufacturing pro producers of the whole world. Reddy's Laboratories, CIPLA, and many other chemical industries are having a reputation throughout the world. These are all due to the contribution to the science of chemistry, especially in India. And ACT supports many of these researchers and teachers in various ways to bring many important products to the market to reduce the pain. For example, drug development, when we talk about all these companies are trying to make a, a cheaper product, a generic product for the Indian population. So these are all the contributions from various chemistry experts. And without uh, taking much time, I would like to talk about uh, the important speakers for today. Uh, today, the in invited speech is going to be given by Dr. Seamus Delani on the topic, enacting changes in systems, situating sustainable development in science teaching. And uh, later on, it will be followed by Professor Uday Maitra, who is going to talk about ethics and academic integrity in research. Because as a teacher, our contribution is not only educating the students of the country, but also shaping their future. Keeping this in mind, I welcome all the dignitaries and other people to this seminar. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your words of wisdom. Dear participants, presidents of today's event is Professor D.V. Prabhu, sir, uh, let me introduce him. Dr. D.B. Prabhu is adjunct professor and former head, Department of Chemistry, Wilson College, Mumbai. He has served as the Dean of Faculty of Science of Mumbai University and President of Indian Chemical Society, Mumbai branch. He is General Secretary of Association of Chemistry Teachers and Editor-in-Chief of GP Globalized Research Journal of Chemistry and Green Chemistry and Technology Letters. At present, he is the Chairman of Bombay Association for Science Education, which organizes several science activities for school and junior college teachers in India and abroad. He has guided eight students for their research degrees. Sir has published 58 papers to date and has uh, his credit 80 presentations in national and international conferences in countries like Belgium, Kuwait, Hong Kong, Romania, and Bangkok. He was awarded the best paper presentation at the 6th International Conference Congress of Chemistry and Environment held in July 2013 at University of Antwerp, Belgium. Dr. Prabhu is actively involved in Indian National and International Chemistry and Junior Science Olympiads. With this short introduction, I request Professor D.B. Prabhu, sir, to address us with his inaugural speech. Over to you, sir. Thank you, madam, for your kind introduction. Thank you, sir. Uh, respected Principal Dr. Dilip Budwaik, respected Principal Dr. Arpan Bhardwaj of Madhav Science College, Ujjain, uh, Professor Brijesh Pare, President ACT, Professor Raki Gupta, National Coordinator of ACT Research Convention, the conveners, Professor Vasudev Gurnule and Professor Swaminathan, and our very distinguished chief guest, Professor B.S. Balaji of JNU, the conveners of the ACT webinar on the chemistry education, colleagues and my dear friends. Good afternoon to all of you. My job has been made very simple by Professor Balaji, who has told you about the activities of the Association of Chemistry Teachers. On behalf of the ACT, I would like to welcome all of you to the ACT webinar on chemistry education. And I would like to congratulate 
Professor Vasudev Gurnule and Professor M. Swaminathan for planning and organizing this webinar on chemistry education. Two years back, we thought of having the ACT research convention, which will focus on the various aspects of scientific research, like choosing a problem for research, how to go about research, how to do the reference work, so on and so forth. And I must say that the convention has been a great success, thanks to Professor Raki Gupta, our convener. This webinar on education seems very important and relevant in the context of the new education policy, which has been released by the government of India. And if you look at the policy, it focuses on three very important aspects. One is a universal access to primary education to all of our children. The earlier policy of 1984 focused on blackboard, but the new policy has three important foresight, universal access to primary education to all children, proper assessment at all levels to measure the learning outcomes, and three, Increasing use of technology in education, that is use of ICT in the learning process. It also talks of investment in research so as to catalyze the journey of our nation towards the fourth industrial revolution. And keeping in mind these four emphasis, teachers like us have the responsibility to ensure that the national education policy is properly implemented. And teacher organizations like ACT will have to play a very important role to implement NEP and to see that there is a transformation in the Indian education system. As ba Professor Balaji rightly said, Association of Chemistry Teachers has been working towards all these uh, goals. And it is now in its 22nd year of service to the chemistry fraternity. Last year, we celebrated 20 years by bringing out a commemorative volume called ACT's Footprints under the chief editorship of Principal Dr. Umesh Chandra Jain, our secretary for North Zone. Last December, we had a very successful National Convention of Chemistry Teachers, coupled with International Conference on Chemistry and Chemistry Education, under the dynamic leadership of Professor Nayan Kamal Bhattacharya of Sikkim Manipal Institute of Technology, Sikkim. This convention focused on how to make chemistry education more innovative. And we have speakers from abroad and India who talked about the new changes in the chemistry education. Apart from our usual activities for teachers, students, and industry, like national and international conferences, national convention, training workshops, chemistry competitions for school and college students, concept tests for BSc students, celebration of the National Chemistry Day, celebration of National Science Day, a newsletter, and ACT awards to recognize distinguished chemistry teachers of our country. And I'm proud to say that this year, the best chemistry teacher award was given to Professor B.S. Balaji, our chief guest. Congratulations, Professor Balaji. You have made us proud. As he rightly said, ACT has been participating in the National Chemistry and Junior Science Olympiad programs right from 1999 in the process of preparation of question papers, assessment, training of the students, and selection of the team going abroad for the Olympiads. In the last two years, the association has started some new programs a workshop on designing quality questions, especially from the viewpoint of the Olympiad, 
under the convention convenership of Professor Subhash Prasad Singh in collaboration with the faculty of Omi Baba Center for Science Education, a web-based chemistry orientation workshop for competitive examinations conducted by Dr. Hemant Khanolkar, our treasurer, Professor Subhash Prasad Singh, and Professor Amar Srivastava. We in ACT believe we have to help our students not only by way of lectures and practicals, but also to prepare them for the competitive examinations. Then ACT Research Convention under the coordinatorship of Professor Raki Gupta, Secretary Central Zone, a webinar on women in science under the convenership of Professor Helen Kavita, our South Zone Vice President, and a global women's breakfast in collaboration with IUPAC under the convenership of Professor Vijesh Pare. And I am happy to tell you, last year, we had the maximum number of entries all over the world. We had more than 70 entries, which was the maximum number. This shows how important the chemistry is in our national life. This year's the Global Women's Breakfast will be held on February 16th with Professor Vijendra Singh as the convener. It will be nice if most of you or all of you sub submit your projects and take part. The association is also giving academic support to a peer-reviewed chemistry journal, GB Globalized Research Journal of Chemistry, which is abstracted and indexed in Chemical Abstracts, CAS, USA, that is the American Chemical Society, and has an impact factor of 1.246. The journal publishes papers in today's uh, and tomorrow's webinar, we have four very eminent experts, uh, Professor Uday Metra, a well-known expert from Indian, uh, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, Professor B.S. Balaji, Professor S. Murugan, and Professor Seamus Dilani from Deakin University, Victoria, Australia. All these four eminent experts will deliberate on various aspects of chemistry education. Chemistry education is changing very fast and new methods are coming in. And so these talks will be of great benefit to all of us. And therefore, it's my privilege to welcome all these four experts to this webinar. I'm sure all the participants will gain immensely from this two-day uh, webinar. You and I wish them good luck. I wish the webinar great success and thank the organizers for their efforts to organize this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your enlightening us with your knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, here we are ending inaugural function of international webinar on chemistry education. Now I invite Professor Swaminathan, sir, to propose a vote of thanks. Over to you, Professor Madam, Swaminathan, sir. Madam. Yes, sir. Madam, yes, Madam sir. Is giving. Rashmi, Madam is giving. Okay, okay. Uh, there is a slight change. So I request uh, one of my colleagues, Professor Rashmi Dube, uh, to propose a vote of thanks. Over to you, ma'am. Okay. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, yeah. you are clear, clearly audible. Thank you. Uh, so, namaste and a very good afternoon to all. First, I pay my homage to Honorable Shri Gobind Ravji Vanzari, sir, founder president of Amar Seva Mandal. I, Rashmi Dubey, on behalf of ACT, Kamala Nehru Mahavidyale, Nagpur, and Mother Science College, PG, College Ujjain, got an opportunity and an immense pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks on this event to all dignitaries assembled here. Firstly, I pay my gratitude to Honorable Dr. Suhasini Vanjari, ma'am, President Amar Seva Mandal, Honorable Advocate Abhijit Vanjari, sir, MLC and Secretary Amar Seva Mandal, 
and Dr. Smita Vanzari, ma'am, treasurer, Amar Seva Mandal, for their continuous support and guidance for organizing such events. I would like to thank our chief guest, Dr. B. S. Balaji, sir, who honored this function with his inspirational thoughts and giving his valuable time. I am also grateful to Professor Rakhi Gupta, ma'am, and Professor Bridges Pare, sir. They cannot join the meeting, but I pay my sincere thanks to them. I express my sincere thanks to Dr. D. S. Barwaik, sir, principal, Kamla Nehru Mahavidyalaya, and Dr. Arpan Bharadwaj, sir, principal, Madhav Science College, Ujjain, to their introductory speech. Thank you so much, sir. I'm also thankful to Professor D.V. Prabhu, sir, for his presidential address and guiding her, us about the government policies for the teacher association. I'm very, very grateful to Dr. W.V. Gurnule, sir, and Dr. Swaminathan, sir, convener and co-convener of this event. Thank you so much. I'm also thankful uh, to today's speakers, Siemens Delaney and Dr. Uday Maitra for joining this inaugural session. And lastly, but not less, I'm very, very thankful to all the faculty members, visual scholars and participants who joined from the various regions and also from the YouTube. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Dubey, ma'am, for proposing vote of thanks. With this, we are ending inaugural session and heading towards the technical session. So, uh, for the technical session, the first speaker of our technical session is. Hello. Yes. So the first speaker of our technical session is Dr. Seamus Dinley. Introducing about our first speaker, Dr. Seamus Dinley is a science education lecturer and researcher at Deakin University, Melbourne Burnwood Campus, Victoria, Australia. Dr. Seamus has worked as a secondary teacher, teacher educator and researcher in Switzerland and Australia. He is a committee member of the Chemistry Education Association. He co-founded the Early Careers Chemistry Network and is a member of the Royal Australian Chemistry Institute. He has consulted for government on chemistry and science curriculum as well as national large scale assessments. He recently re returned from Switzerland when he, where he worked on a number of science, technology and educational assessment projects with the Center for Science and Technology Education. Dr. Seamus completed his PhD at the School of Chemistry, Monash University. Dr. Seamus is currently involved in an ongoing international interdisciplinary projects focused on repositioning chemistry as the sustainability science through systems thinking approaches. Seamus' other research interests are the incorporation of digital technologies such as augmented and virtual reality into teaching and learning and science education in out-of-school <laughs> informal learning context. Sir has delivered lectures about chemistry and science teacher education at secondary, primary, and early childhood level and have served on the committees of professional organizations and volunteer groups that advocate and facilitate strong continuing education programs for science educators. Sir was invited as speaker in number of teacher and academic based conferences and symposiums internationally. Also is part of an international interdisciplinary project focused on repositioning chemistry. He is a strong believer of uh, situating these new technologies within cognitively challenging, collaborative and engaging contests, which leads to the development of positive identities for pre-service teachers as learners and teachers with new technologies. As a research academician in Melbourne, Australia, he is also involved in a number of projects that share this vision. With this long list of credits, 
I humbly invite our speaker, Dr. Seamus, to deliver a lecture on the topic, Enacting Change in Systems Situating Sustainable Development in Science Teaching. Over to you, sir. Thank, thank you. Um, thank you for that uh, delightful introduction. Uh, am I audible? Can you can hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, so you're great. clearly audible. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen so I can hopefully the presentation comes up. So you're seeing that now as well? Yes, sir. Great. Well, thank, thank you um, very much again for those kind words and um, a big thank you to for the invitation uh, to speak to you today and your amazing association. Uh, I thank you as well and uh, my condolences, I must say now as well, to uh, Dr. Prajesh Pra for the invitation. Um, and I'm um, just a, a humble custodian of the work that we've been doing down here uh, with my research colleagues. So I hope for the next, let's say, 40 minutes, um, I can show you through some of the work we've been doing. Yes, I'm. Uh, my name. I am from the School of Education. So, our, our, the chemistry and the science education research is done a little different here. This, I, I predominantly work um, in initial teacher education, so I, I train teachers. That's why I'm in the School of Education, but a lot of our chemistry research happens in the School of Chemistry and the School of Life and Environmental Sciences that we have here in Deakin, so I'll, I'll describe that a little as well. And, yeah, I'm, I'm right down the bottom, Melbourne in Australia, and, um, yeah, I've not been to India. It's, it's a fault of mine, but I, I will go one day. Some of the, uh, if you're interested to know more, some of the things that I'll be showing you, um, we've put up on our website um, for our little sort of small research group that we call Elements of Sustainable Chemistry. Uh, and there's a website link there for you if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> as I always do, and, and many of us do here in Australia, I, I wish to start my presentation with an acknowledgement of country. Um, I join you today. Um, from the lands of the Wurundjeri people, the First Nations people and traditional custodians of the country in which I live and work and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging. I'm very fortunate to find myself on uh, Wurundjeri, Wurundjeri land. Um, many of our first chemists, our first scientists um, come from um, the land of Australia you know, we, our first miners, our first bakers, our, our first um, aquatic farmers. There's, there's so many great rich stories that um, we could do more to incorporate into our curricula. So I, I wish to acknowledge um, that I'm on the lands of Wurundjeri people today. I thought, <coughs> let's see how this goes. I always like to do something interactive with the audience. And I thought it was a, a nice, a quick sort of mentee um, to get some thoughts about what, what words come to mind when you think of um, chemistry and sustainable development? So I'm going to put this in the chat. I'm going to put it in two places, aren't I? Because I need to put it in the... I'm going to try the YouTube one, and I'm going to try to put it as well. I'm not having a bit of a Zoom failure here. Well, there you are. There's the chat. Um, I'm going to put it in the chat as well. So there's a link just there. But if you know too much about Menti, you can just go to menti.com and um, there's a link, a code there. But I've also, if you click the link that I've put in the chat, you'll be able to just go directly there as well. Just add a couple of words, a word or two, that when you think of um, chemistry and you think of sustainable development, um, what words come to mind? Um, I understand the YouTube's on a bit of a 20 second delay, so maybe it's not coming up yet. Some people are writing into the chat, so that's good as well. Um, yeah, obviously green, green chemistry is a good one. Worth waiting for that first response to just check that it's actually working. <laughs> Waste, here we go. First one's in. When, I, when we run these, um, I, I run this at most of these presentations I've done. 
um, both in Australia, but also um, at international conferences. And it's always amazing to see um, the, the, the great variance of um, words that can be in the local context as well. So um, there's a few responses here in the chat. So for instance, the better understanding of chemicals. Yeah, that's, that's anyone here. Um, here we go, distillation. Extraction, yeah. So this idea, perhaps thinking about a lot of our thoughts around sustainability nowadays are thinking about how if we are going to take things out of nature, we have to do it in a way that's sustainable and not taking more than, than we can we can use and utilize. I tell you what, I might come back to that and I'll see how many um, extra responses come through. We might have a look at that cloud at the end and, and see how many, but I'm, I'll keep going for now. So I, I thought to just introduce the idea somewhat to when, when we talk about systems, we talk about one thing we always seem to think about when we talk about systems of knowledge and systems of, of energy and mass is to think about the scale. And from a, from a public, uh, uh, publication in Nature, um, last year, and it was sort of putting out this idea that we have just reached a point where the global anthropogenic mass, in other words, mass that's made by us, now exceeds all living biomass um, in the world. The, the study, uh, obviously a very eminent study published in Nature, suggested that in 2020, you know, plus or minus was the year that that happened, and on average, each person on the globe produces anthropogenic mass equal to their own body weight every week. Another way to put that in context, um, in that same paper, thinking about what, what that anthropogenic mass is. Um, the drove is concrete. So con I'm going to talk about concrete a little later, but you know, aggregates, gravel, um, bricks, all those other little things there. So we often blame things like um, plastic for everything, but look at all the other things that essentially make it that anthropogenic mass. Um, there are there are basically now eight gigatons of plastic um, on in the in our sort of system uh, in our global system, which is double um, the mass of um, living animals. There's now also more buildings and infrastructure. So all that concrete, all that aggregate bricks, asphalt and so on, then there are trees and shrubs. So we're really starting to see, you know, this is the scale of the issue we're talking about. Who's responsible for that? Well, I hate to say it, us, chemists. You know, chemistry is, is the science that understands and controls and transforms matter. So if, if anyone should really be responsible for the way that we have transformed matter to, you know, for our own purposes um, in many fantastic ways. Let's never forget that. But, you know, it was chemistry that did it. And so chemistry education and practice probably therefore has an important responsibility to address this to be done more sustainably. And how are we doing? Well, not great. Um, it wouldn't take you very long to scroll through um, any sort of social media feed or, you know, news, news, um, news websites to find some pretty horrendous stories. This is one that was sort of late last year, um, the story of nurdles. And maybe you've, you've, perhaps you've not heard of nurdles, but nurdles are essentially the little tiny bits of plastic that we yes. use um, to produce bulk plastics. Yes. We, we get really small bits, we carry it around and they turn a thing. But inevitably these really tiny little balls um, end up in um, they, they fall out of um, processes, they turn up in waste, and now they are just astronomically large. And, and here's a, a fairly sad picture of a, um, a fish who's just in these nurdles and has died from association. Um, so we are now, this is now the issue of the 21st century. We're now dealing with this idea that we have an enduring contribution and personal reliance on plastics. It's an essential component of our lives. We, in no way can we pretend that we will not be dealing with plastics um, in the near future. Plastics are just part of what we do. Almost everything we, I'm, I'm looking around the room and I, I'm covered around in, in plastic materials made from fossil fuels. So we can't escape that. But now we are dealing with a situation 
where they're going to have a permanent and chronic impact on our human health. Um, microplastics, they're, they're in our, our drinking water. So this is a wicked problem. Um, it, it, I'm not, I won't go into wicked problems now, but essentially we call this a wicked problem. It's a, a problem without an easy solution. And it's therefore it's one that requires some complex thinking. And what better way um, to have students reason is to have them students reason through complexity. And in doing so, they would feel comfortable to make affirmative action. And so when I talk about enabling change, that, that, that story will come back later. That's the story of perhaps us using too much of something and it's now everywhere. Flip that story around for a second. And one consequence of using too much of something is that you tend to run out of what you're using. And so here's two stories of um, things that we're running out of. Um, the world is running out of sand. Now, that sounds ridiculous to say. Um, well, we're running out of a particular type of sand and it is really causing some massive, massive um, ecological, environmental, social issues um, globally. Um, I, I read a, a fantastic book on this topic a couple of years ago um, by Vince Bezer, and the link there is to a, um, a podcast, but also a news story, um, a recent news story looking at this issue. Why? How are we running out of sand? Well, sand predominantly gets used for two things. By far the number one thing that sand is used for is concrete production. Um, sand is the number two used material in the world, the first one being water. And you can't just use any sand, you have to use a particular type of sand, uh, river sand, as it's sometimes called. And that's the sand that we're running out of. Um, it's so diabolical that, um, I always tell this story, Australia, where, where I come from, um, ships and sells sand to Saudi Arabia. Um, and th because they don't have that particular type of sand they want. So I think that's really a truly silly story. On the right there is a report um, published by Amnesty International and Africa Care, um, looking at, and it's, it's, it's got a provocative title, but a correct one. This is what we die for. The story of artisanal cobalt, cobalt mining. Um, in the De Democratic Republic of Congo, still to this day, um, the majority of cobalt um, is mined and it's mined artisanally. In other words, um, local people will go out into um, areas that they can access um, the minerals and they will quite literally so dig and sort it out um, by hand. In many cases, um, by uh, children. Um, and where does all that cobalt go? Well, all that cobalt goes into our modern batteries that are in our electric cars and they're in a lot of things. Everyone seems to think of lithium as the first thing, but, you know, um, cobalt is a, a very large component of lithium iron and lithium, uh, new generation lithium batteries. Um, it has just the right size to be able to handle lithium iron to move across and recharge. So cobalt is really, really, really important to our future. And we, the world is reliant on children um, being involved in the mining production of it. So we're, we, this is a story that you can bring up in a chemistry classroom. Why would we need so much um, cobalt? And why, well, we need so much of it for all these things, you know, um, the MacArthur Foundation put out effectively saying that the requirement, the, the needs for lithium and cobalt are doubling about every five years. And yet we don't have um, that amount because um, many of the elements in our periodic table. So this is a, perhaps you've seen this one before, but this is a slightly different view of the periodic table. Um, we are running out of um, uh, elements, about 30 to 40 of our elements could be considered endangered. Now, how on earth can an element become endangered? Well, and some of them are becoming really, really seriously threatened. Um, you know, zinc, gallium, germanium, um, hafnium, these are ones that there is, a, there is a good chance that we could run out of in the next 20 to 30 years. Um, that sounds preposterous. The, we live in a, a generation where we are all so reliant on microcomputers, microtransistors, uh, microcomponents. Many of these rely on um, germanium, gallium, arsenic-based alloys, 
And so we might consider ourselves a generation with smartphones and all this. We could you consider for a second that we might be the last generation um, with smartphones? The because what if we don't really come up with a secondary way of doing this when we run out of these? Now, of course, um, we're all chemists, right? I, I heard one of our distinguished colleagues describe himself as a physicist. The physicists would be laughing at this comment. Of course, we're not running out of these elements. They're there all along. They're in our waste, uh, in our electronic waste. You can't, chemists don't destroy elements. <laughs> we just rearrange them. And we are re we're rearranging these elements into waste that is very difficult um, to resort. Um, your mobile phones can have anywhere to 30 to 40 different elements in them. And they're very, some, some of the easy ones can be easily sorted and reused, but not all of them. The vast majority of metals are not easily recycled, including, including lithium and cobalt. Um, you know, things like we think when we think of successful recycling stories, we think of copper and aluminium. Um, but many of the elements that you see there in uh, yellow, orange, and red are not easily recyclable. So we are, we are going to run out of them unless we come up with a solution. I think we, I, we run programs here with schools and we think how many students have heard the stories of endangered species, you know, they can all name an, uh, name an animal that is, is running, um, either is becoming extinct or is extinct, um, but perhaps they can't really name an endangered elements. And so we often run programs to get them to think about that. So to sort of bring that together a bit is that what I'm suggesting here is that we need to start thinking of a way of integrating our learning of chemistry. Um, we've, we've got a strong history of that in the chemistry education research community. You have to go back to Johnston to start thinking about, well, how can we compartmentalise perhaps this understanding a bit more? How can we say, yes, chemistry is difficult to learn, sure, um, but what makes it difficult? And so Johnston sets out this idea that thinking of chemistry, understanding on both the macro, in other words, the observational levels, the submicro, in other words, what's happening, um, the explanatory level and the symbolic level, the language of chemistry, putting those three levels. And so that's why chemistry can be difficult to learn because we're being asked to, he described it as mental gymnastics. We're being asked to think of these three levels at once. And then um, Hafey comes along and says, well, maybe this is, we should humanize chemistry education. So he introduces this idea of the human elements, the idea that if we think about the human aspects of what we're learning, it is more intrinsically motivating and engaging for the students to learn. But today we're asking um, our students and, and our educators to go a bit further, connect that human story with social impacts, with economic impacts and environmental impacts, because these are the global challenges that we are facing today as society. And so chemistry education and chemists and chemical engineers all have an important role there. Um, it was Vicente Talanqua, uh, his article um, late, late in 2020, that sort of really tried to articulate that by saying that we, somewhere along the line, we have, we've made an untenable disconnect between the learning objectives of what we set in our chemistry classrooms and our chemistry curricula with those critical global challenges that our students will be facing. And so we need to somehow connect these better. It's not as if they're not asking for it. Um, the Royal Society of Chemistry in the UK put out a very large um, survey and a report of uh, students and educators in secondary school settings. So, uh, ages, um, years 11 to 19 years old. And young people, the vast majority, they expect to be educated on this. They expect to see climate change and sustainability as a priority for a chemistry curriculum. They, they, they want this to happen. <laughs> um, not as much, but clearly still very highly, educators also understand or they can see that there's not enough, that there's at the moment, when they look at their chemistry curricula, when they look at sort of the lower secondary, the middle secondary, and the senior secondary programs that these students are using as entrance into university and postgraduate programs, is that they, they can see in the chemistry curricula as it's set is they admit that there's not enough 
um, focus on climate change and sustainability. So the students are screaming out for it. Um, the educators also acknowledge that the chemistry curriculum is not up to standard. When asked what were some of the topics that they think should be integrated better in, these are the three that they highlight the most. Carbon literacy, so thinking about how which sectors of industry, um, you know, the chemistry and chemical engineering sectors, how they contribute to climate change. Life cycle analysis and understanding better um, the role of material, role of chemistry in developing those new materials that are so intricately linked to society. And then, as I've sort of been talking before, probably too long, about the finite nature of resources. So, um, elemental conservation, recycling programs, the stories, stories such as cobalt and, and why they're critical, and so on, and, and societal in, implications. I've already gone for 20 minutes, so I'm going to go a bit faster. So, this is where systems thinking comes in. So, systems thinking is where we start to <laughs> recognize that we need to shape the change, shape the practice of chemistry to be more sustainably focused. Um, we do that by reorientating chemistry education. That's what I'm doing today. That's what I'm doing with you. Today. I'm trying to convince you, I'm making a case for it, that we, we, we need to reorientate chemistry education to address those sustainability um, and those challenges. Because then we're educating about this, then we're educating about the molecular basis of sustainability and, we're, and systems thinking. That in turn will have our students, our educators, our members of society acknowledge that um, how we see society today is so intrinsically linked to a materials basis. It's the materiality of our lives that are connected to those sustainability challenges. And so how we use materials how they are recycled, what um, the way that we develop those materials, that in turn will bring that circle back around and that will change the practice of chemistry in our universities and research settings. So it will force that change, it will carry it forward. The sustainable development goals um, are a really nice visual way, an articulate way that those, um, how practice change the practice of chemistry, but also science is being done. And meeting those 17 goals by 2030 is going to be a tremendous challenge, but it's one that perhaps we are capable of meeting. Um, systems thinking was uh, is a big way that that's happening. Systems thinking has a much richer history in other areas of science, but not so much chemistry, strangely. Um, chemical engineers would go, well, of course, we've been doing this all along, but perhaps in chemistry, it's not been as... Um, obvious to us in, in our practice. Um, it was great to see that uh, in 2019, in the Journal of Chemical Education, there was a whole special issue allocated to that. Um, uh, some colleagues of mine and I were lucky to get one article in there. And if you go to that special issue, you'll see many, many examples of how systems thinking can be applied to in chemistry education. Um, that program is continuing today um, by looking at um, how systems thinking is related to sustainability. So this year is the International Year of Basic Sciences and Sustainable Development, and you will see some resources coming out in the next few weeks and months, um, more about the work that we've been doing in that IUPAC group. So I'm very lucky to be led by eminent researchers such as Professor Peter Mahaffey, Professor Stephen Matlin, um, and many others. There's about 20 or 30 of us that work in that group, and, and we are sort of contributing to that. Now, if, if I have time, I'll get to show you a few of those examples at the end. So what, what, if, I, if someone was said to me, yes, but what is systems thinking? Um, you know, there was uh, a great article that was in that um, special issue um, by Sarah York and Mary Kay Orgel, um, who was like, well, yeah, but really, what is it? You know, so they came up with sort of five characteristics um, to direct. So I'm going to set out those five very briefly. Um, in a, a systems thinker starts to identify um, the interactions between a system and its environment, including with humans. Um, it recognises a system as a whole, not just as, as a collection of parts. Dinesh, I, I see you put your hand up, but is it just, I'm going to have hopefully some time for questions at the end, if that's okay. 
Yeah, I'll keep going. Um, it starts to examine relationships among those parts. Um, so I'll, I'll show an example at the moment. We start to see how systems change over time and the behaviours, and so we can start to identify and measure those changes and then start to see it on time. And we start to think about variables that cause system behaviour. So you put all that together, it's effectively saying we start to see relationships between parts of the system. We acknowledge that they change over time. We acknowledge that the system, they, ha they themselves have an impact on the system. And then lo and behold, humans have a role in that. If I, I'll try and go a bit quicker. If I show an example of that, um, one of my favorite, I, I'm, I'm still a chemistry educator. One of my favorite demonstrations is um, to get a, a little bit of um, um, NO2 in a tube um, and bang it in a, uh, a tube, seal it up and you see the color. And so you can have that equilibrium between NO2 and N2O4 and you can use it as an example of showing um, dynamic equilibrium as an example of Le Chaudier's principle. Um, and so he, the picture in the left is uh, you, know, you put it in the hot water and it goes more brown, so it goes further to the left and you put it in the, um, the ice water and it goes more yellow. So you know, you're shifting equilibrium due to temperature and pressure and so on. So it's a, it's a fantastic way of you know, visualizing and, and bringing color to chemistry. Sure, that's great, but it's quite a very elaborative analytical way of doing it. It's, 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 it's focusing on a very small part of that. It's failing to acknowledge the bigger picture of what is NO2. It's photochemical smog. Um, photochemical smog and is, a, is a very prominent chemical phenomena that occurs in large urban cities. Um, it's predominantly a, a factor from the combustion of fossil fuels and, and heavy industrialization of areas. And so this is including, and, and photochemical smog in turn influences other human behaviors. The presence or absence of photochemical smog impacts decisions that humans make every day. And so there is chemistry clearly having an impact on what we do. Um, if we start to look for relationships, we start to realize that actually the amount of NO2 present is due to the conversion of the nitrogen oxides coming out of our cars into NO2, but also it's being decomposed. <clears throat> NO2 gets decomposed uh, photochemically. So on a sunny day, smog will go down. And so you start to, well, these are the things that actually change the amount of NO2 in the air. Um, if there's more photochemical smog, less people will go outside. So less people, less people will walk to work, they will drive to work. That will increase the amount of photochemical smog because there's more cars on the road. And so there's a good example of a, a feedback loop. Um, the presence of photochemical smog leads to more people to drive, which leads to more photochemical smog. And then you can extend that story to really identify the interactions between the system and its environment, including humans. So health, here's a chemical chemistry story linking to health impacts of living in cities. Um, the social justice issue of people not being able to afford to live outside of the city. Um, and so they, due to their living standards, are forced to live in large urban areas with photochemical smog. They do not have the, the luxury of being able to live outside the city. And so you start to think about democratic participation, all from that simple story of NO2. So they're the sort of stories that we try and show. Um, uh, my research group here, Elements of Sustainable Chemistry, and working with my colleagues here in the STEMI research group, at Deakin University, um, we, we, we have an emphasis on practice. We have an emphasis on um, designing materials um, that can be used in, in classroom. So we, we work with teachers, professional, we run professional learning programs. We co-design teaching and learning activities with uh, teachers. So predominantly, we just get a few teachers together. We go, right, what will be good for your classroom? What will work for you? What, and we, we, we go off their ideas and we, we work with them to develop activities. Um, I'm going to skip. Uh, so an example of that would be uh, we got some money. We were very lucky to um, win some uh, win, win, uh, win a grant from the Australian National Commission for UNESCO to develop some practical activities for endangered elements. Um, 
the story that I told you about. And so we, we went out to schools all across Victoria, here in Australia, the state here in Australia. And we showed, we did a lot of activities. We burnt, we turned copper into silver and gold. We, we made an aluminium air battery, which is a sort of a similar analog to metal air batteries that are being used um, in, in today's technologies. Um, we, we grew copper crystals and aluminium sheets, but all of those stories were linking to elements that are considered endangered now, nowadays endangered. Um, we actually recently just published that. Um, you can find uh, links to all those activities and uh, it's in Journal of Chemical Education. Um, one of those demonstrations that we did on those days was one of my favourite, the, the mini thermite, the reaction of aluminium and iron oxide. It's um, you take a, uh, a little spoonful of aluminium and a little uh, aluminium powder and a little spoonful of um, iron oxide powder, put them together, and we, we would use a little um, party popper, um, uh, one of those fancy sparkle candles, and to give us a bit of time to get away from it, and then the whole thing would light up. Um, the Royal Society of Chemistry have a very good explanation of how they do that demonstration. Don't ever do it in a funeral. That's my number one rule. Um, but it's the story of aluminium. Aluminium powder, aluminium, group three metal, uh, to get aluminium, pure aluminium, takes a huge amount of electrical energy. And so what better way to show the amount of electrical energy you put in to make aluminium is to get all that energy out through a chemical reaction, hence thermite. It's aluminium is that recycled metal that we're very good at recycling, but we use a huge amount of electrical energy to make it. Um, about 3% of all of the globe's electrical energy supply is used just to make aluminium. Um, it's, in Victoria, it's even worse. We have one aluminium smelter left in all of Victoria. There's, I think there's only about four in all of Australia. That one aluminium smelter in Victoria uses 10% of all of the electrical energy that's generated here in Victoria. Um, another comical story to that is that the aluminium smelter is about four hours drive west of here um, in a city, in a little town called Portland. But all of the elect almost all of the electrical energy is made predominantly in Victoria still through brown coal and coal gasification. And it's made about two hours left of here. So they're six hours drive apart. But um, the thankfully, the company that owns the aluminium smelter is now looking at um, making wind and uh, tidal power. So building a huge wind farm off the coast of Australia near where they are. Uh, a practice we've been really having lots of fun with um, in the last uh, 12 months or so was um, doing sustainable concrete. I spoke about concrete at the start. We were really enticed to the story about um, how do you make concrete sustainably? And so we found a few companies, a um, few innovative partners here in Victoria who were making gravel out of, because um, essentially concrete is just water, sand, um, some sort of cementous material um, and gravel, anything bulk, like any sort of stuff to give it a bit of bulk, bulkiness to it. And so we, we found a company um, that were taking recycled materials and turning it into plastic gravel. Um, we, we found a company that was making, rather than using sand, they were breaking down glass. So taking recycled glass and mining it down into a fine material that resembled the sharp, sticky, the sharp, sharp bits of river sand that you would use for concrete production. And so we, we made a, a practical activity that was making these little um, aluminium, I've got one right here, no, it's too far to reach. Little, little 10 centimeter carbon uh, cement pillars, sorry, so these little 10 centimeter pillars. And we, we sent these to about 50 different schools uh, around Victoria and we got them to try it out. So we got them to make the pillars. We got them to try and break them. It was a good control of variable experiment. So they were controlling one variable and changing the others. So, you know, sand, cement, um, you know, recycled materials, not recycled materials. So using waste concrete to make concrete, you know, using concrete as your gravel. So all these are great. And they found many fantastic stories. And, and I think that that's really coming out at the moment. We haven't published it yet, but we did put an article in a teacher magazine um, that sets out 
um, the activity. And also you'll find um, those resources up on our website as well, um, eschemistry.org. Uh, in the future, uh, we're working on this project, um, Future STEM Gen, uh, is uh, we're looking at making dye sensitized solar cells, bioalgae, smart gardens, but I don't really have much to say on that because um, on this it's one. happening this year. One other thing that we do, and I, I did mention it, was um, we work closely with uh, teachers and schools. They're really our, our great passion because if we can convince teachers to make these changes in their practice, those changes will influence the students that they work with. Um, so we run every year a co-designed um, teacher action research project. So teachers come with us, they spend one or two days um, with us, you know, we show them a lot of innovative research, a bit like what we're doing with you right now, and you're, you're having such a similar experience today. And then we work with them on the second day to go, okay, well, let's come together and design something that you could do in your school. And then they, at the end of the year, they communicate their research findings at a teacher conference that happens every year in February. In fact, the last year is happening next week. Um, and so they, they pay it forward. They show what they do to other chemistry teachers and hopefully those chemistry teachers get influenced to do the same. Uh, one big thing that we did um, over the last couple of years was getting them to make systems maps. Um, this is one that the 2019 group of teachers did where they would take a chemical process and they would put it in the middle. And so this is the, the Harbour Bosch process. Uh, the story of ammonia is such uh, a really powerful story for systems thinking, but I, I won't go through that today. But they would look at all the ways that what goes in to make ammonia, what ammonia gets used for, and also what are some of the unintended consequences of that usage? You know, so what, what else does it lead to? And then that brings up that story oh, about funny. chemicals having benefits and hazards. Um, there, it was Tom Home and, and Tom Hutchinson who said that uh, chemicals have benefits and hazards and these must be considered together. Chemistry educators have a role to really point out that we have, um, we have so many great success stories. But as we say in systems thinking, um, yesterday's um, solutions are today's problems. Chemistry co contributed to many of the solutions that um, for society in the 19th and 20th century. The 19th century is often referred to as, you know, the, the the, the, the century of chemistry and 20th century, the century of physics. But the 21st century could be now called, you know, the, the century that chemistry has caused many of these problems. There were solutions in the past, you know, plastics, fossil fuels, but now they're the problems of today. And so having our students think, see chemistry for the pros and cons, the benefits and hazards, is a really pedagogically important message for our students to see more of. So we did that, we got them to make these maps. Um, here's an example of um, looking at the story of polylactic acid. So the students had at that school had made a practical activity, they'd made some polylactic acid, they decomposed it um, and got them to think about all the positives and negatives of that story and connected it. All those numbers that you see there are connecting it to the sustainable development goals. Um, here's another example, looking at ocean acidification. So here's a, a student who was asked to basically say, just, um, you know, look at all the, we, we learned about ocean acidification when we were talking about equilibrium, you know, in year 11, year 12, which is senior chemistry here, that's often when we introduce um, equilibrium to students. Well, here it is, um, you know, going into more detail and, and linking to the human impacts of um, uh, anthropogenic emissions. We have to be a little careful though. I, 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 whenever I show that example, I always fear that ocean acidification, well, what's the positive there, right? There's no positive. So I guess it's, it's important, as I was saying before, to emphasize chemistry's contributions to solutions, but not just um, the problems. And so here's another example. It's the same, same class who did that map and another student did this map. Um, and when they're asked to try and link the sustainable development goals, this student um, just said everything is negative. You know, it's like they couldn't see how chemistry was making the world better. Um, they could just see how chemistry was making the world worse. Now, is if you if that's the message that students are getting, 
um, one or two years before they go off to university. I dare say, and this is a student who's probably not going to study chemistry at university. So I always, I always um, put that message out to say, okay, we just need to be a little careful. Um, but just be careful to emphasize that uh, the benefits and hazards. Um, what better way to do that is, uh, I'm probably gonna leave you on this one, aren't I? Because I've got, how long I got about five minutes? Um, the planetary boundaries framework. Now, it is the International Year of Basic Sciences and Sustainable Developments, and a big focus that IUPAC is doing to produce teaching and learning resources um, in this international year are framed around the planetary boundaries framework. I probably don't have enough time to go through it in too much detail, but can you imagine that we've essentially made nine boundaries, um, and you can see them there in the picture, that set out um, if we were to keep a sustainable uh, Earth uh, in the Holocene, we need to stay in that green area. Orange, things are getting a little dicey. Red, um, that is not a sustainable world. And we are heading into the Anthropocene no matter, no matter what. Some people say we're already there, um, but essentially if more than those things cross in the red, we're definitely there. There's no argument. Um, where can I learn more about this? Well, I don't have time to explain it to you today, but one fantastic place that you could head is um, the, K, the KCVS.ca, which is um, directed by Professor Peter Mahathy in the King Center of Visualization and Science. Um, they have a website um, where you can go and you can click on each of their boundaries. You can move that, see that time, that year, year scale. You can move it up and down. You can learn more about it. Um, we're now working with um, uh, Dr. Sarah Coral uh, at the Stockholm Museum Centre. Um, they're adding more information. They, they publish an amazing paper about novel entities. Um, and that's really, again, significantly changing what we know about how the novel entities are impacting our planetary boundaries. And you can play there. It's interactive. It's for students. It's for teachers. So go to that link. There's a link there to an introduction video. It's on their first page as well. I thoroughly encourage you to go look at it. Some of the things you will see there. Um, again, coming back to biogeochemical flow, the story of NO2. Um, NO2 uh, is we're, we're way past the nitrogen fixation rate. We, 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 we use far too much um, nitrogen and anthropogenic nitrogen. Um, nit nitrous oxide human emissions essentially now about 40, uh, how, about 43 percent of all the emissions from NO2 are now from human sources. Um, so, in the past, where we've had, um, of course, natural sources, so from the oceans, from land, from fluxes of um, uh, organic matter, um, of course, N2O, uh, NO2 and N2O would go into the atmosphere all the time, but the vast majority of it is now from anthropogenic sources. And that has led to an imbalance. Um, our ocean sinks and our land sinks just can't get up enough of that. And so that anthropogenic source has changed, has led to an abundance of N2O and N2 in the atmosphere. Why is that a bad thing? Well, of course it's a bad thing, but um, if you look at the way, um, if you look at the way that we have uh, control the ozone. You know, ozone levels um, are, are in the green. We're, we're okay in ozone levels, but for how much longer? You know, many of the things that in the 1980s of the Kyoto Protocol that we can we can controlled, we eliminated. So in the, the grey there on the graph, you can see all the things that um, were contributing to ozone depletion. We relatively got that under control. We don't really use much CFCs in the same way. But N2O is now having a significant impact on our ozone. So maybe the success story of the Kyoto Protocol is at risk that we are starting to see ozone depletion yet again. Um, we, many of you will know this story. Uh, it's, of course, no great surprise to say that um, carbon dioxide um, concentrations in the air certainly are at a high risk. We have crossed that boundary significantly. We are in the red and many other things are contributing to that. Um, the, you know, CO2 um, has a very low global, global warming potential, 
Um, other ones are far worse, you know, methane, high, uh, HFCs. Well, why? And I know, give me two more minutes. I, I'm going to say that the uh, greenhouse gases um, is a really rich story to go into um, because why are we significantly worried about um, things like methane and N2O than we are, say, carbon dioxide? We're very worried about carbon dioxide. How worried about these things should we be? Well, some students who learn about infrared spectroscopy, another topic that tends to get introduced to chemistry students uh, in a senior, senior secondary setting, so pre-university, is they'll get told about infrared spectroscopy and maybe they'll be asked to, I, the way we, we do it here in our curriculum is to get them to identify unknowns. Um, it's okay, it's interesting, but it, it lacks a connection to global challenges. And so this is a great picture. You can go look at it um, on that King Center. They've got this, uh, it's, this is an interactive. Um, I'm showing you there the infrared spectra for carbon dioxide. And that black line there is the black body curve. So it's the, the energy intensity that's coming in um, from our sun. So you can see there that actually where the majority of energy is being admitted and absorbed in the Earth's um, atmosphere, it's carbon dioxide does not um, absorb energy at that um, wave number. So not an issue. Here is N2O. So you can see there clearly that there's that huge band there at about 13, uh, 1250, 1300 centimetres that it is definitely absorbing energy from um, uh, that's being absorbed by the Earth. So that's that energy is being, rather than being reflected out into um, the, uh, the outer atmosphere of the Earth, it is being absorbed by these gases because they absorb energy at that infrared spectrum. It's far worse for other ones, HFCs, KFCs, KFCs, CFCs are uh, absorbed far more. And so that's why it's, there's a nice story there to link infrared, learning about infrared spectroscopy to global warming potentials. I, the, the person who introduced me there at the start said that um, we work a lot with uh, uh, state programs to look at their uh, curriculum. We in Victoria, we are having a new curricula delivered next uh, this week. Next week, I think it is, um, and we will be we'll start teaching with that in uh, February next year. This will be twelve months to sort of do some consultation and development. I'm I'm starting at the moment to develop some advice for teachers for that. And so we have a new study coming out. And when, when, the, when the draft version came out in July last year, we were so thrilled, I was so thrilled to see many of the things that we've talked about today incorporated. We had sustainable development challenges set out explicitly as goals for students to learn. We had linear and circular economies defined in the curriculum documents. We had individual sustainable development goals named and a focus in dot points of the chemistry curriculum for students to learn. So there were so many great things. And it's uh, at the time I thought we we're really going forward. That was the day that the public draft constitution came out. The next day, this is front page of um, uh, the, the, the state's largest um, newspaper, a very large um, uh, called The Age. It's probably the largest paper we have here in Victoria. Front here, look at chemistry education on the front page of this um, this newspaper, and the caption is "Goodbye periodic table, VCE chemistry set for elemental change." So it was a, uh, and there was a cartoon there, people complaining. Um, many members of the public were really horrified that this curriculum suggested that we spend less time on teaching the history of the periodic table, you know, less time talking about 200 years of old white guys, you know, thinking about theoretical challenges in the periodic table and actually addressing global challenges and green chemistry principles um, that we need to uh, challenge today. And so um, there was a huge outpouring of um, anger on social media and, and through the newspapers. Um, I think the, the version that we see next week will be slightly different, but it'll still have a lot of sustainability, but um, they did manage to get some of that history of the periodic table back in. So yeah, we're still going to be talking about old white guys for a while. 
That's really all I want to say. I feel like I've gone about a few minutes over. I wanted to save a bit of time for questions. But um, if you want to know more, uh, there was a great article written by the people that I work with in that IUPAC group that I mentioned, led by Peter Mahaffey and Stephen Matlin and Baipal Saha, to name just a few. Um, really sets out that story really nicely and some of the ways that we're we're meeting the, um, with, with what we're trying to achieve this year with the International Year. And um, I want to really acknowledge the people that I've worked with along the way. Um, Madeline Schultz and I really worked together on the elements of sustainable chemistry in that program. But, you know, Joe, Jerry, Lisa have helped us along the way. My colleagues that I work with in the IUPAC group, um, the National Commission for UNESCO provided the funding. The Chemistry Education Association, yes, I'm the secretary, but they also support us a lot along the way. And uh, many of the others, some stories. And, and it's the students and teachers that you see there um, that have really been our volunteers and programs. And so it's really a joint effort. I'm here today, but it's a joint effort, the work we've done. Okay, um, I'm gonna finish. I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I'm more than happy I, to take a few questions before the next speaker. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for the brainstorming session and introducing our participants with chemistry related to sustainable development and detailing us about system thinking chemistry education. Uh, if any participants wish to ask some questions, they can ask. I'll put my um, email, I'll tell you what, I'll put my email back up. Um, people are more than welcome to, oops, I can't do this quick enough, can I? I understand sometimes it's not easy to just sort of come up with a question on the spot. Um, so what I can do is I can put my email back up on the screen and you're more than welcome to, um, oh no, that's my Twitter account. Um, I'm just gonna type it in there. So if, um, and I'll put it in the, the chat as well. Um, but you can find me, I'm at Deakin University and we're, we're more than happy to uh, work with others and other researchers in what we're trying to achieve here. We, we have a really great program here of um, chemistry and chemical engineering. Um, so that they spend the majority of the time working on it. We, we're just lucky we come along for the ride with the educators and, and getting some of the fantastic work that they do, getting them into schools. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you for providing your mail ID. I hope surely participants will contact you if they'll have any query. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So moving ahead to this second speech of today's technical session. Our next speaker of today's event is Dr. Uday Maitra, sir. Uh, let me introduce our uh, next speaker. Dr. Uday Maitra is currently professor at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He was postdoctoral research associate, University of California, Berkeley with Professor Paul A. Barlett. He has done his PhD from Columbia University, New York with Professor Ronald Brislow. Sir has many awards to his credit, such as Dr. Darshan Ranganathan Memorial Lecture, CRSI IIT Kanpur 2019, Acharya PCRA Memorial Lecture, NIST Thiruvanthapuram 2018, Baba Kartar Singh Memorial Lecture, Punjab University 2017, Alumni Award for Excellence in Research, IIC Bangalore 2017, National Best Chemistry Teacher Award, JNCASR 2015, Silver Medal, Chemical Research Society of India 2012, Materials Research Society of India Medal 2009, and so on. participants, mute your mic. He is member of International Advisory Board, Chemistry Society of Review, also part of Editorial Board Member, Asian Journal of Organic Chemistry. Sir is also a member of American Chemical Society and Royal Society of Chemistry. He's a national representative of IUPAC Committee on Chemical Education. 
Sir, research interest is to explore new chemistry and supramolecular chemistry using bi-acids. These studies include the design of molecular receptors, design and properties of cationic, neutral, and anionic analogs of bile acid. He also have a program on the design of functions of materials such as composite, organic, inorganic hybrid materials. Recent work in this area has been in the development of luminescent hydrogels and a novel pro-sanitizer based sensing of enzyme, small molecules and selected drugs on a paper-based platform. Today, Sir is going to deliver his lecture on the topic, ethics and academic integrity in research. With this short introduction, I welcome Sir and request him to deliver his speech. Over to you, Maitra Sir. Good afternoon and uh, thank you very much for the rather elaborate introduction. Good evening, sir. <laughs> and um, I thank uh, Professor Swaminathan and other uh, members of the organizing committee for uh, the invitation to participate in the event this afternoon and uh, give a talk. After the very inspiring talk by the previous speaker, Dr. Delany, um, on, on a subject that is very important and uh, really important for chemistry in the, uh, in the present day context, uh, I will make a departure and talk about something that is broadly related to education and science education and uh, not quite connected to chemistry. Uh, and I thank Professor Swaminathan for agreeing to uh, accept this uh, lecture title. Uh, during the last few years, in fact, we realized that uh, there are many students, teachers, and researchers who are probably not aware of certain guidelines uh, on ethical guidelines in particular about plagiarism and things of that sort, which are very important in the present day context. And therefore, I have tried to put together um, a talk uh, on, a, on a topic in which I'm really not an expert of. Uh, so let me share my screen and uh, as it is mandatory, ask all of you whether you are able to see this slide, test slide. Yes, yes sir, it is visible. Excellent. So for housekeeping, I have also included a couple of my uh, landline numbers in my office in case there is a network issue, you can quickly call me on these numbers. So, uh, so this is what I would like to speak today about uh, ethics and academic integrity in research. And uh, I should again start uh, with a disclaimer that I myself have never taken an ethics course. Most of the information that I'm going to present today are sourced from publicly accessible portals. Um, and I have also tried my best to appropriately acknowledge the source of the information from which I have taken the, uh, made the slides. I'm not going to show all the slides today. I have a fairly large number of slides, but I'll, uh, uh, I have hidden uh, a great majority of them. So I will try to finish by 4.30 as, uh, or maybe a few minutes more. But if anybody, uh, would like to have the entire presentation, I'll be more than happy to share a PDF uh, file of uh, this entire presentation. So here is a brief outline of what I would like to share with you this, this afternoon. Uh, I will start with the main sources of my information. And I would also like to provide a few definitions of the terms that I'm going to use time and again during my uh, talk. Uh, I will have a sort of section, the initial part, which will be information for students, students of all categories, particularly those who are in the, uh, who are doing research, but then it applies to pretty much everybody. Uh, I will also have a separate section, which is information for researchers, which will include perhaps a large number of participants who are uh, present here today. And towards the end, I will uh, focus a little bit more on plagiarism and publications because it seems to me that you know, there are a lot of, sort of uh, lack of information on what constitutes plagiarism. So I will probably end up repeating uh, some of the definitions on plagiarism and mention it more than once. Uh, let me start with a, on a lighter note. Uh, this is uh, from one of these Twitter handles shown on the bottom right. 
uh, professor saying that copying from one person is cheating, copying from many person is research. Perhaps that was an accepted norm some decades ago, but uh, not anymore. And this is something that uh, students at all levels uh, should, uh, should understand and appreciate. So one of the main uh, sources of my uh, presentation is this uh, book on ethics in science education, research and governance, which is published by the Indian National Science Academy. Uh, it is sold through the INSA office, but you can get a complete PDF uh, of this book uh, on the link shown at the, at the bottom. So the entire book is available. And in the next slide, I will list out the various chapters in this book so that you have some idea of, of uh, what's in there. Um, there are uh, chapters on ethics in higher education and academic research. Let me see if my, uh, if my spotlight is working. I hope you are able to see this. Ethics in higher education and, and academic research. Then there's a section on ethics of research ethics of publications, ethics in science governance, and so on and so forth. Uh, I would also like to highlight another source of information. This is our Institute's policy for academic integrity in research. Uh, and this was created uh, by some of us. In fact, I happen to be in the group which uh, put together uh, this uh, short uh, uh, document. Uh, and uh, this document is also freely available from the site, uh, from the location shown at the bottom. So this also focuses primarily for academic integrity in research for researchers. And then there is also uh, a document which is meant for students, uh, uh, again, focusing on our institution, but it applies to students of perhaps many other categories. Let me start with some definitions because when I started preparing this lecture almost a year or so ago on for a different uh, purpose. Uh, I was also not quite sure about some of the in, in uh, some of the definitions. So uh, I will start with some definitions of ethics, morality, academic integrity. So that I think will um, will will benefit all of you because I think most of us uh, probably have not taken any course on ethics or philosophy or anything along those lines. So ethics is concerned with what is good for individuals and society and is also described as moral philosophy. Uh, so some of these things, you know, if you simply type uh, in, in a Google search, you will uh, get some of these hits. And uh, this word, of course, has been, is, is derived from the Greek word ethos, which can mean custom, habit, character, or disposition. Academic integrity is the moral code or ethical policy of academia. And I will just stop at that um, because there are sort of minor variations in the definitions, but I would like to go back and try to define a few, try to get a few more definitions on ethics and morality because ethics and morality are interrelated, but not quite synonymous. Uh, for example, uh, here is one uh, definition which actually has some problems because it talks about the definition of ethics, but then in the definition itself, the word ethical principles and ethical uh, problems come and that makes the understanding a bit difficult. Uh, morality basically has its roots. I have highlighted the text here in, in belief of a society while ethics aim at formulating the principles to justify human behavior. And uh, let me just go to the other one, uh, next slide. In academics and research, often certain unethical practices occur due to sheer ignorance and lack of discourse. <laughs> and that is one of the reasons why I thought that this particular uh, theme or this particular topic may be appropriate for the audience that we have here today, because some of you can probably take it forward and uh, perhaps educate uh, the group of students and teachers uh, that you are associated with. Again, uh, there are more definitions, which I will probably skip. Um, the next few slides, you know, I have also taken slides from other sources. These are slides taken from my colleague, uh, Professor Chandrasekharan. Uh, this is the simplification of all the rather complex definitions, which uh, I had indicated in the previous slides. 
uh, but these are sort of more strict definitions uh, which are favored by uh, philosophers. But when most people think of ethics or morals, they think of rules for distinguishing between right and wrong, such as the golden rule, which I have uh, stated here, or a code of professional conduct like the Hippocratic Oath, which says, first of all, do no harm. You don't do any harm because you don't want somebody else to do any harm on you. Uh, but the most common way of defining ethics uh, would be the norms for conduct that distinguish between what is acceptable and what is unacceptable behavior. And here I would like to make a distinction between ethical guidelines and laws, unethical versus illegal. Of course, there's a very general statement one can make, that wrong is wrong if everybody is doing it, right is right even if no one is doing it. This is a picture that we see almost every day on the Indian roads, which are notorious, uh, the drivers are notorious for breaking rules. For example, you see this, uh, traffic passing through the red light, and uh, this is wrong. This is not only wrong, but this is illegal. So illegal is an act against the law, while unethical is against morality. So this is something that you know we should probably try to understand uh, right in the beginning, that there's a very clear distinction between what is illegal and what is unethical. Illegal behavior is easy to detect. Uh, however, unethical behavior is tough to detect. And as you would appreciate that international laws are similar for all, for example, the driving rules are pretty much the same in all countries. Uh, but international ethics may differ for different religions and cultures. So what uh, may be applicable in a country in Europe, what would be considered as ethical or unethical in a European country may not be true for an Indian uh, community. So one has to make a distinction between these. But then today we are talking largely about ethics and academic integrity in research, in science. And, and therefore, these principles or these guidelines would be more or less um, you know, global in that sense. So let me focus uh, a bit on the academic integrity for students and researchers. And uh, basically, one of the statements that has been made in our uh, uh, the document in our website, which is listed at the bottom, uh, isc.ac.in. And uh, again, this is a PDF file that is freely available. The link is given there. And this is meant for our own students. Although when I check with the students, many of them are in fact not aware of this. And, and that's one reason, you know, that, that a, a periodic lecture on these topics are, are desirable so that the students get to know what's, what's there or what sort of information is available on, on the website, which they're supposed to know. Um, so let me uh, uh, talk about it here uh, in this document that I have highlighted a couple of things that of course everybody would agree that a flourishing academic environment entails rigorous and sincere adherence to ethical practices and therefore, it is expected that the researchers and students would be aware of uh, commonly recognized unacceptable behaviors in research and in research communications. So the three broad categories of improper academic behavior, this is largely for students, uh, are plagiarism, cheating, and conflict of interest. Again, these are things that I think we, we all know about it, but I have tried to put together some information from different sources so that you can make use of it you know, in the future for your own students. So plagiarism, of course, all of us know what plagiarism is. It is a use of materials, ideas, figures, pretty much anything without appropriate acknowledgement or permission of the original source. So what is important here is that without appropriate acknowledgement, this may involve submission of materials, verbatim or paraphrased, that is authored by another person or published earlier by oneself. So in other words, uh, reproducing in whole or part text or sentences from a report, book, thesis, publication, or internet is not acceptable. Even reproducing my own previously published data, figures, images without acknowledgement is not acceptable. 
So what is important here is that many things can be taken, can be copied and presented uh, with citation of the original source. Of course, you cannot you know, reproduce a whole page. Uh, there are certain accepted guidelines about it, about how much you can, you can reproduce. And most of it which can be reproduced should be within quotation marks and with um, proper citation of the original source. And again, self-plagiarism is also something that I have uh, indicated here. Uh, I will come back to plagiarism once more towards the end, uh, but let me go to the next part, which is uh, cheating. And this is also another form of unacceptable academic behavior. And uh, as uh, everybody is uh, aware that copying during exam, copying of homework assignments, term papers or manuscripts, allowing or facilitating copying, or writing a report or exam for someone else is simply cheating and it is unethical and unacceptable. And in some cases, of course, it is illegal. Uh, and again, using unauthorized material, copying, collaborating when not authorized and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, fabrication and falsification of data and reporting them in thesis and publication, I would like to sort of expand the scope and also include the reports uh, term papers which students prepare even at the undergraduate level and in many cases in, in the high schools also. So fabrication is making up of data, falsification is manipulation of data. And I will show you specific examples of, of, of issues related to fabrication and falsification as we go along. Um, conflict of interest is uh, something that is often not properly understood which uh, is a clash of personal or private interests with professional activities that can lead to a potential conflict of interest. In diverse activities, it can mean teaching, research, publication, work in committees, research funding, consultancy, and so on and so forth. So nowadays, I think for most, committee, uh, uh, most committees which are set up by the government, all the members have to sign a conflict of interest uh, document which says that in case, for example, if my student is applicant for a research grant and I happen to be in the committee, I cannot be discussing his uh, research proposal when a decision is to be made whether funding uh, has to be given or not given. So I cannot be part of party to the decision. So because that is a clear case of conflict of interest. So uh, most committees nowadays, uh, uh, work with this very strict conflict of interest policy. Um, I will again not uh, highlight what I have written in the text. There is a lot of text here, but uh, as I said, that you know, I'll be happy to share the entire document with you, and I will not go into the. I will not read out for all that I have written here on the slides. Um, research misconduct is also becoming a very serious issue, not only uh, in in a country like India, but it's a global problem. So before I talk about research misconduct, uh, let me show you in the next slide in some sort of a flow chart, how research originates and, and gets done. You know, it's not just scientific research, but it is research perhaps uh, in many areas. So typically you will start with an idea. The idea develops into a proposal. The proposal is submitted for funding. And if it is funded, it gets executed and that develops new knowledge. And of course, there is, a, there is a cycle between, let me get to the laser pointer that may be a little easier. Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, frequently, you know, the idea develops into proposal, but it doesn't get funded. So, so between idea and, and, and funding, sometimes you have an itinerary process. It goes uh, through several cycles. And of course, if it gets funded, you work on the proposal, execute, generate new knowledge, and new knowledge can be in the form of papers, patents, products, PhD students, master students, and so on and so forth. And then there is a possibility that unethical practices in different forms are known to arise in all the steps shown above, uh, in development of ideas, in the formulation of the proposal, proposal to funding stage, funding to execution, execution to new knowledge. I don't have time to describe uh, all the steps, uh, problems in all the steps, but I will try to highlight at least 
some of them. Uh, research misconduct constitutes a very serious deviation from the accepted practice in proposing, performing, reviewing research, and reporting research results. And it includes, but not limited to, as I said before, fabrication, falsification, plagiarism, and or deliberate interference and misrepresentation. So I will try to again briefly point out each one of them, but uh, I should point out here that misconduct may also occur in some of these issues, which can be misallocation or misuse of funds, uh, research, uh, sexual harassment, gender discrimination, but these will not be discussed today because these uh, misconduct in any of these issues related to any of these issues uh, are very serious, but it does not affect the integrity of the research record. And that's basically what our focus is for today's presentation. Fabrication is making up of data on results and recording or reporting them as if they were real. Falsification, on the other hand, is that you have some data, but it is manipulated. It is manipulated uh, research material, equipment, processes are changing or omitting data or results without scientific justification. It also includes improperly reproducing copyrighted material rather than acquiring the material from an authorized source and such as using unlawfully procured or downloaded ebooks and e-chapters. So this is again something that one has to uh, realize very uh, clearly that uh, if uh, you are using material which is not from an authorized source, it, 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 it basically implies that falsification is involved in this. Plagiarism, again, uh, one more slide on plagiarism, so I will not repeat it, but again, I just would like to highlight that it is appropriation of another person's ideas, processes, results, words, or works without giving appropriate credit to the original source. Uh, Self-plagiarism is also part of plagiarism. I will not read out or highlight any other part of the text shown of the, on the, in the second paragraph. Uh, deliberate interference can also be a very serious problem, and that involves essentially intentionally causing material harm to the research or scholarly work of others. It doesn't actually have to be research. If it is somebody is writing a report and another person comes and destroys it, this causes, this is a uh, case of deliberate interference. So it can be damage or intentional or reckless unauthorized use of research related property of another person without, of course, uh, any uh, agreement. It may also include, uh, again, use or removal of any other substances or devices used in the conduct of research or produced by the conduct of research of another, you know, removing somebody's sample or, or, or a spectrum produced by another individual. So this is also deliberate interference. And is, again, it is uh, absolutely unethical, um, jo uh, an unethical uh, conduct when someone involves in deliberate interference. Misrepresentation, again, I will not go into the entire text, but I've highlighted a few of them. For example, it would involve, for, for, excuse me, let me go back. Uh, forging signatures, falsifying ac academic records, fabricating research, giving false sources, and so on and so forth. Again, um, as I said, that I will not uh, try to uh, give more detailed description of each one of them, but I have highlighted a few of these points. Uh, but something that we need to uh, understand is that research misconduct does not include what one would call honest error, honest difference of opinion, or honest differences in the design, execution, interpretation, or judgment in evaluating research methods or results, or simply bad research or poor research. However, it is not easy to find out whether an error reported, let's say, in a publication is a deliberately done error, uh, is it a result of a deliberate, uh, uh, you know, uh, unethical work, or is it because of an honest error? Uh, whenever such a situation arises, typically a, you know, committee is formed to find out whether it has been an honest error. Sometimes it can so happen that 
Uh, I'm using an equipment which is not in good shape. It is giving wrong results. And I have obtained some results from the uh, sort of bad equipment and try to interpret and present that as a, as a finding. Of course, this is bad research, but it is not going to be considered as something that is unethical in the sense that it is an honest error. I was simply not aware of, uh, of the problem with, with the equipment. This, of course, is bad research. Uh, no, no question about it. So the student roles, for example, this is something again for our uh, own institute, but I would like to highlight what uh, IISC has been doing that before uh, a thesis is submitted to our department, for example, the student has to check the thesis for plagiarism using freely available software or sometimes using uh, commercial software. And the student must certify that the academic guidelines of the Institute, which I have highlighted you know, in, in one of these earlier uh, slides, uh, have checked uh, their documents for plagiarism and the thesis is original work. Of course, everybody writes it and signs it, but uh, a web check-in sometimes does not rule out the plagiarism. So uh, the, what a guide has to do uh, is to ensure that the entire thesis goes through a commercial plagiarism check software. And I will show an example of that uh, for one of my own students, just to give you a, 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 an idea about how, how this works. And we are also uh, responsible for ensuring that personal compliance with the above broad issues related to academic integrity are, uh, are, uh, are there. Okay, and so some of the guidelines for academic conduct, uh, which uh, again are from our institution's uh, website for students, uh, highlight that proper methodology for experiments and computational work must be followed. Uh, the data should be accurately described and compiled. And of course, this is something you know, known to all of us uh, researchers that carefully record and save primary and secondary data. Um, you know, nowadays, almost everything is computer controlled and sometimes you do not actually get to see the, the primary data, but it is very important that when a student presents the data to the supervisor, uh, it is not the derivatized data that are shown first, uh, the raw data should be available and uh, not destroyed. Uh, another uh, point uh, is that uh, robust reproducibility and statistical analysis of experiments and simulations when the work involves such uh, procedures must be uh, adhered to. And uh, as I have un underlined ah. the that it is important to be truthful about the data and not to omit some data points to make an impressive figure, oh, no. uh, commonly called cherry picking. Oh, All right. Uh, again, continuing with these uh, guidelines is the lab notebooks have to be well maintained and then uh, the you know, text in the lab notebook should be the student's own words. And of course, some of these uh, issues also apply to even high school students who generate uh, posters and, uh, and other types of reports on assignments uh, using you know, information from websites to a large extent, but then at times the source is missing or at times it is just verbatim copied from a, from, from, from a website. And of course, it is absolutely essential to give due credit to previous reports, methods, computer programs, et cetera, with appropriate citations. All right, uh, the next few slides, I will simply flash rather quickly. These are slides uh, with the magenta uh, border. These were taken from uh, my colleague again, from uh, Professor Chandrasekharan. Uh, this I have already shown. Uh, this is basically uh, the statement made by various other individuals, and I am now focusing to a large extent on plagiarism. Uh, and uh, basically what this statement says is that presenting the data or interpretation of others without crediting them and thereby gaining for yourself the rewards earned by others is theft. And it eliminates the motivation of working scientists to generate new data and interpretations. What can be plagiarized? Pretty much anything and everything generated by somebody else. It can be words, ideas, findings, illustrations, lectures, printed material, electronic material, anything of 
that is original work created by somebody else. And therefore, the bottom line here is that don't copy, don't cut and paste. Uh, if you do, whether lazily or deliberately, you are a plagiarist and thus guilty of plagiarism. It is an academic offense and can lead to sanctions like any other academic transgression. Uh, this is some old data, but I don't think it has changed over the years. It has probably only become worse. Uh, among the various types of ethical issues uh, in, in publications, so this, is, this refers to publications in Elsevier journals, almost 12 years old. Uh, you know, some of these uh, percentages or, or the uh, cases by the type uh, are shown here, duplicate public submission, duplicate publication, conflict of interest, authorship issues, but you can see that the plagiarism has the highest occurrence during the, at, at that time. Uh, so correct citation is the key, that is crediting the work of others, including, for example, my advisor's work or my own previous work by citation is very, very important. Sometimes it is important that uh, my own words are also reworked, it's paraphrased. Uh, and uh, this is not basically changing them word for word, but it is restating another idea using my own words. And uh, so when encapsulating the work of others, when citing a reference, it is acceptable. What is unacceptable is actually using exact phrases from the original source without enclosing them in quotation mark, something I already mentioned, uh, emulating sentence structure even when using different words. You know, that is also considered to be unacceptable. Paragraph organization, even when using different wording or sentence structure. I get a flash that my internet connection is unstable. Uh, if you don't hear, you let me know. Um, yeah, in terms of detection of plagiarism, uh, there are certain commercial software. Our institute uses a software from Authenticate called Turnitin, and let me show you an example of this. So uh, in this, what, what, what happens in most of these cases is that manuscripts or a document or a thesis is checked against a database of tens of millions of peer-reviewed articles from hundreds of publishers. And then a similarity index is produced. And uh, by going to the similarity index, one can understand uh, whether a major uh, plagiarism issue exists. Of course, one has to know where to look for the uh, similarity index. Uh, for example, if there are certain common statements which are made in almost all the thesis uh, work from our institution, uh, that is something that will be constant in almost all the theses. Similarly, the, uh, the bibliography or the, or the list of references should also be excluded from this search, or, or you have to ignore those because that will also show, uh, you know, understandably a very high percentage. So a high percentage does not necessarily indicate plagiarized text. As I said, it could be legitimate citation and bibliography. <laughs> So let me show you an example uh, from a thesis uh, which was uh, submitted by one of my students last year, in July 2021. Uh, so the student and I independently put it through Turnitin. And you see that you know, there have been 117 occurrences of a thesis submitted for the degree of. But this, of course, is a, is a phrase that is there in every single uh, thesis from the institute. Similarly, the address that is shown here that is also constant. So, so similarly, uh, many other uh, issues uh, were highlighted. But when I went through it, I realized that a major issue was basically in the citations, which is absolutely fine. And in the text, I did not find any, any problem with uh, plagiarism related issues. OK, so this is, this is how it, uh, it, it goes. So towards the end, let me um, very quickly highlight a few other issues. Uh, I already mentioned about this so-called cherry picking. Uh, so sometimes this non-publication of data, uh, which is otherwise you know, collected by the same researcher is also not uh, acceptable. And sometimes these are not included in the results because they don't support the desired outcome. So that is not acceptable. But then some data are bad data, but then bad data should be recognized when it is being collected or analyzed. 
And then there should be a justification of what constitutes bad data and why it has been justifiably removed from the from what has been presented. Um, so data gathering, of course, has to be done with the highest level of integrity. Uh, as I said, that you know, broken equipment can give you bad data. So the equipment should be first fixed before collecting any data, and so on and so forth. Um, there are issues related to authorship, but let me skip uh, those things because I would like to uh, go to a few other uh, issues about uh, uh, about a few real life stories because uh, this is also important to realize that any of these problems that I described earlier, like falsification of data, fabrication of data, um, willful manipulation of data, or uh, creating difficulties for others can always lead to problems. And let me share with you a few uh, real life stories. Some of them are old, some of them are not so old. Uh, this is an example of a fabrication of data, which was uh, highlighted uh, uh, a number of years ago, in fact, almost four decades ago, uh, on a paper which was uh, published in Tetrahedron in 1979. And a uh, couple of years later, three years later, a paper came out in Tetrahedron Letters. This is for those who are not organic chemists. This is one of the top organic chemistry uh, journals. And it has remained so for uh, over a large period, uh, length of time. Uh, John Confort, by the way, uh, is a Nobel, was a Nobel laureate. And he basically was not able to verify a reported synthesis of a particular uh, natural product skeleton. And finally, he concluded that the reported products of these three stages were in fact not obtained. So it was basically the data were completely fabricated, wrong, uh, wrong yields, wrong, uh, I mean, everything was fabricated. The experiments were not done. Um, so, so uh, the drug was not able to agree to that. Here it can be the drug in that. So here is another example of a uh, uh, of falsification and deliberate interference. Uh, uh, again, I will not, in this case, specify who did this. Uh, um, a very highly reputed professor assigned a very challenging project to a new PhD student, B. The student completed some work and reported that the results are really exciting and uh, matches precisely with what the professor hypothesized. So professor was excited, the work continued and led to three quick publications in a top journal. And very soon it was realized that the results appear too good to be true. And at least one fundamental principle has been overlooked while interpreting the result. That of course is, a, is, a, is an honest error. But more seriously what happened is that because the, it was honest error because it was the interpretation which was in question, okay? It was not the data. But more seriously when the experiments were repeated independently by another group of researchers, it was confirmed that student B had deliberately falsified the experimental results. And also when others were trying to repeat, the student B tried to interfere with the experiments which were being repeated by others. So this amounted to deliberate interference. So eventually the student B had to leave the institution without completing the PhD. And of course, this entire thing uh, damaged to some extent the reputation of professor A, and the professor A was commented as saying that this cost him a major scientific prize and that prize is nothing but the Nobel prize. Okay, uh, you should, uh, I, I think that we, we should also uh, be aware of a website called Retraction Watch because a number of uh, publications which have been found to have problems are often retracted uh, when the problems are either discovered by others and a very, in very few cases by the researcher or the corresponding author, um, corresponding author himself or herself. So uh, if you go to Retraction Watch, uh, you know, this was taken a couple of months ago. Uh, there were uh, several features which are uh, indicated uh, here every week. And this particular week when I have taken this data, I have highlighted a few two Japanese universities revoked the PhDs of two students, one for plagiarism and one because of cell line contamination. Okay, you can very clearly see that this was, the results were based on poorly done experiments. 
Elsevier retracted an entire book that was plagiarized heavily from Wikipedia. Um, then again, you know, Imperial College London researcher fired for research misconduct. And this goes on and on. Um, in fact, during this COVID period, you know, many papers were published and eventually retracted. And, and I think the COVID probably is a, is a topical theme from which the largest number of papers have been uh, retracted. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the ones which caught a lot of attention was a 5G technology and induction of coronavirus in skin cells, which I'm sure that many of you uh, were aware of. So I had taken these data uh, towards the end of November, and you can see that uh, on COVID-19 itself, 194 papers were uh, retracted. And this is kind of a list of, uh, well, this is a list of infamous uh, scientists, I would say, who had the highest number of attractions. Uh, but something that uh, perhaps uh, you may be surprised to know that uh, many uh, publications can be, high, can be retracted even uh, decades after publication. So, for example, uh, Lancet uh, had a paper published in 2011 uh, by a Japanese group. And in early 2021, 10 years later, uh, they realized that this was actually a duplicate publication because the original publication was in a journal, uh, this journal, a Japanese journal published in 2010. And basically this paper and the paper published in uh, Land said they were uh, identical, but the same authors, as you can see, but the text uh, was pretty much identical. So it was a duplicate submission and it was published in 2011 and retracted in August 2021. And therefore, it is a very clear case that even if it is published today uh, and if there are problems found, uh, you know, decades later, it can still be uh, retracted and can bring disrepute to the, to the authors. Uh, this is again from October, 2021. There are some news items related to the retraction, why uh, some of the top five papers which were retracted, um, the topics and the themes and why they were retracted. So this is, uh, these are things, you know, which uh, should not be read just uh, for the sake uh -huh. of uh, looking at the retraction, but also this provides, uh, some sort of an education for the research community, for the students that, uh, you know, it is very important to be honest in presenting data, uh, to present whatever you have obtained to the, to the supervisor. And uh, for example, not go through any kind of a plagiarism, plagiarized text and so on. I hope that, you know, I've been able to uh, give you a broad overview of what constitutes uh, some of the ethical and academic integrity guidelines for, uh, uh, for research and also for students. And I hope that some of the documents that I have uh, shared with you and uh, I, will get, I will provide the links uh, once more if necessary, uh, will be of use to you. And uh, as I said earlier that, you know, I am not uh, an expert in the topic that I spoke about. So most of the things were put together from different sources, but I hope that some of it would be useful to you and your students. Uh, I think I have already taken a few minutes of extra time, but before I close, I would like to uh, um, I would like to inform this community uh, uh, that uh, the next uh, international conference on chemistry education uh, will be held in Cape Town in person. This is ICC two zero two two, which was supposed to be held two years late earlier, but because of COVID, it was uh, postponed a couple of times. So there was a meeting about two weeks ago of the CC, the Chemistry uh, Committee on Chemistry Education, and they confirmed that assuming things uh, don't go for worse, uh, don't go for a spin again, uh, this will be held during 18 and 22 July. And here's the website. And they asked me to share this information with the teachers community in India so that everyone um, who is interested would apply uh, and participate in this uh, event. So with this, I would like to conclude. And once again, um, you know, for the entire community, perhaps the message is that we continue to stay safe, wear masks, avoid crowded places and maintain physical 
distancing. Those of you who might be interested in getting a sort of a transcript of this uh, presentation on all the slides, including those which I did not show, uh, my email address is right here. So with this, I would like to conclude my uh, afternoon presentation now, and I'll be happy to share um, any, I, I'll be happy to answer questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, participants, you can ask any query to sir. Sir, one question. Huh? Yes. Swaminathan. Yeah. No, no. Actually, I've been uh, just talking about it. again a very nice lecture on this, you know, ethics uh, for students as well as for the faculty members. Very nice lecture. But the thing is that about the plagiarism, if you go for authenticate check and even affiliation and acknowledgements, they are being, I mean, uh, given as, you know, uh, I mean, repeated words and all these things. And what to do for that? Because uh, how can we avoid, uh, not only that, even that uh, common words like catalysis or photocatalysis or degradation, all are uh, punched eh? and they are giving us 20% or 30%. So yeah, what to do for this? Yeah, no, th that is absolutely not a problem. You know, certain words or phrases, which, for example, every student writes the same general experimental procedure taken from one of the, you know, earlier members of the group. So the general experimental from, you know, all cases from a particular research group will always be identical, more or less. So I think that's not a serious issue. The serious issue is when the text in the, in the, in the body of the thesis, when entire paragraphs match with something that is already in the literature. So if the okay, entire... For thesis, but for publications, I mean, that is a thing. It's the same thing for publications as well. You know, sometimes uh, if, if my paper, for example, comes back from the publisher saying that, you know, there is a this much of, uh, um, you know, similarity index is high, then I have to look at where the similarity ind index comes from and then I have to fight for it. If it is only in the acknowledgement section, or for example, in the, uh, let's say in the list of references, then obviously that is- can they include this, I mean, can they exclude the experimental part or these acknowledgements and affiliation? Why yeah, I think well, it, well, experimental, yes, uh, yes and no. I mean, if it is, uh, even if it is um, uh, based on my earlier uh, publication, for example, I should still change the text. Uh, even if it is an identical, and if it is an identical, I no, need not show the same, you know, procedure in another publication. I can only cite the earlier one. Unless I've done something different, I do not need to repeat it. And even if, for example, I was writing a review article and I had to make sure, uh, you know, twice, for example, that I don't copy, uh, I or my coworker, uh, we do not copy anything from the earlier, earlier uh, documents. But this is also a problem in many proposals. Uh, because uh, those who uh, submit proposals that to CSIR or, or DST, in, SCRB in particular, they have to give a certification that you know it has not been plagiarized. Uh, so uh, I reviewed a proposal which had this certificate, but when I put it to an authenticate, I found that entire paragraph from the introduction was in fact copied from a uh, from a journal. And so clearly the PI who submitted the proposal did not have a clear idea about what constitutes plagiarism. Yeah, yeah. It is not very uncommon. Is, Sorry? Two, three sentences are consecutively paragraph, you can, I mean, say that. Absolutely. Like Absolutely. If it so is one more thing, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. Another thing is, suppose we are reproducing our own figures in the next publications, not reproducing. We are giving as characterization, but the review, reviewers, they want that the figure to be included in that. In that case, we are including that, but it becomes as a self-plagiarism. But it no. is because of the reviewer's request, now we are doing it. No, in, in that it cannot constitute plagiarism because you simply have to put a copyright uh, notice here and you have to take permission from your original publisher that I'm going to use it for my review article or another publication. And then this is almost automatic now. You can use yeah. your uh, earlier published figure, but actually, what happened, happened to one of my friend is yeah. he got the permission from the publishers. Yeah. Till then, even then, that the paper was retracted by the editor. It was uh, so happened. He went to ethics committee. Ethics committee also didn't want to interfere with the editor's, I mean, decision. 
Okay, this this does not sound right to me. I mean, I don't know the details, but in general, if I get permission from a public publisher of my earlier publications to reproduce a figure, then uh, there should not be any problem with the subsequent, you know, new new publication. I mean, review articles are written like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Prabhu, your uh, microphone. Yeah, Prabhu, sir. Hello. Uh, hello, Professor Metra. Yeah. Very nice lecture, excellent presentation. Thank you. Just uh, want to ask one thing. Sometimes uh, when we submit a paper, uh, because of this self, uh, so-called self plagiarization, the paper comes back, you know. And uh, sometimes when we uh, draft a new paper, it is to a large extent based on the text of the earlier paper. So we try to change it. What do you think is this justified? To reject a paper on the basis of so-called self plagiarization. Well, these are the rules set up by the publishing houses, you know, um, that uh, they do take self plagiarism very, very, uh, very, very. <laughs> I, I, I know the, um, I know an example of a very well known scientist who was accused of self plagiarism because he used a phrase. Uh, and and one sentence, one maybe two sentences from an earlier publication without any change, and uh, it went on for quite some time. And eventually, the uh, you know the scientist was uh, uh, reportedly said that that is the best way to describe the phenomenon uh, that we observed, and therefore I don't want to change the sentence. But if if I use uh, you know. Uh, Sentences without any change from my earlier publication, I should put them in quotes and give a give a citation. So that's the key. Thank you, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, if any participants have further query, they can write it in the chat box. Uh, thank you, sir, for telling us the real definition of research ethics and mo morality, giving roadmap to the researcher uh, about the research to the research student and also telling us about the plagiarism. So thank you, sir, for giving us your valuable time and knowledge. Now I request Professor M. Swaminathan, sir, to propose vote of thanks. So thank you very much. So I think I didn't have a chance to hear the lecture of this previous uh, speaker, but I had a chance to listen to the lecture of Professor Uday uh, Maitra. So he has given very clear picture about the ethics to be followed by the students as well as the faculties. So all of us know that should be aware of this one. Students as well as faculty should be aware of this one. So that the paper will not be, you know, that rejected or whatever it may be. So that is why he has given a very nice picture, very nice, all the guidelines. And thank you very much, sir, for your very wonderful and also very, I mean, interesting. At the same time, it should be created, like created an awareness for the students as well as for the faculty members. So thank you very much. So I thank once again, our Professor Odey Mitra for giving this nice lecture. So thank you very much. I thank the previous speaker also, but I could not have this uh, lecture because of my previous you know, problem here that in the native place, so the net, net, net problems. So thank you very much. I thank once again the organizers for giving me a chance to propose this word of thanks. And I also I thank Professor Uday Mitra for sparing his time and give this valuable lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, Swaminathan, sir, for proposing thank word you, of thanks. You. Uh, Professor Bhutu, a... sir, thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, Swami. Uh, I could not join earlier. Sorry. Yeah. Both lectures were excellent. Okay, right, right, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you, thank you, thank you madam. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, there is just a, a short information for all the participants. The link for the feedback will be posted in the group itself for today's attendance. And now we have come to the day one of this international webinar. And we will meet again with the same energy and enthusiasm tomorrow at 3 p.m. for the next technical session. Till then, a very good bye to all of you and have a good day.
Okay, good knowledge. Thank you very much. Let us see. Bye. 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 Thank you, madam. See. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Maraj ki chhe chhe.